the 9612th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the Security Council, I'm sorry, Security Council Resolution 1160 of 1998, 1199 of 1988, 1203 of 1988, 1239 of 1999, and 1244 of 1999. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Serbia to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. On behalf of the Council, I welcome His Excellency Mr. Alexander Vucic, President of the Republic of Serbia, and I request the Protocol Officer to escort him to his seat at the Council table. He's not arrived. We will suspend the meeting for a few minutes, so I apologize.
So we can resume the meeting. So the meeting is resumed. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms. Catherine Ziadeh, Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of the United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I also invite Ms. Vyosa Osmani Sidriu to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to draw the attention of Council members to the document S-2024-282, the report of the Secretary General of the United Nations Interim Administ Administration Mission in Kosovo. I now give the floor to Ms. Karlin Ziadeh. Madam President, distinguished members of the Security Councils, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to brief the Council on the latest developments in Kosovo. I note this is my second address this year, owing to the extraordinary session held on 8th of February. Madam President, the Secretary General's report before you covers the main developments from 19th September through 15th of March. Allow me, therefore, both to update you on significant developments since and to offer you few observations of the situation in the wider perspective. I have held many consultations with political actors in Pristina and Belgrade, with religious leaders, civil society organizations, and with our main international partners on the ground. One of the key common observations is dissatisfaction with the level of progress being achieved through political dialogue and the direct effects this has upon the security situation. The level of mistrust, unfortunately, remains high and must be addressed. During recent months, tensions have simmered, with one major explanation being an inability to address long-standing issues through adequate communication and dialogue whether this be between Pristina and Belgrade or between the Kosovo Serbs communities and the Pristina Central Authority. Over several months, sustained efforts have been focused on resolving the contested issue of local government legitimacy in four municipalities populated mainly by ethnic Serbs in the northern part of Kosovo. In December last year, Kosovo Serbs in Leposavic, North Mitrovica, Zubin Potok, and Svechan collected a sufficient number of signatures, well over the required 20% of the registered electorate, to begin the process of recalling the mayors elected there in April 2023 by less than 4% of total registered voters due to the Kosovo Serbs' decision not to participate. This process, long discussed in the framework of the EU-facilitated talks, has aimed toward reducing the tensions which inevitably resulted from these elections, including violent protests that centered around several municipal premises in northern Kosovo last May. Recently, representatives of the Kosovo Serb community in the north have claimed that the conditions set forth to recall the mayors do not allow for all representative participation in the recall vote. Subsequently, EU and Quint country representatives based in Pristina have urged a reconsideration of this position. 
While Kosovo Serbs have responded that their arguments are legitimate and being insufficiently accounted for. The recall process took place yesterday without any security incidents. However, only 253 out of 46,556 registered voters cast their votes. This, unfortunately, sets the stage for protracting and prolonging a fragile and unresolved issue. From our point of view, we will continue to support the EU-facilitated dialogue at the forum to find a consensual resolution of outstanding issues. Madam President, over the past year, there have been numerous setbacks in efforts to build more confidence in peaceful relations among Kosovo's ethnic communities through political dialogue. The Secretary General in his reports and I in my briefings to the Council have previously reported on an, a number of these setbacks while wider international attention was drawn by the serious security incidents which occurred in the village of Bainska last September. I continue to stress the importance of accountability for that extremely serious incident through a thorough fact-based investigation and assessment of its circumstances. This is both a judicial matter and also a political necessity in order to avert any recurrence. Across the same period, numerous developments have caused hardship and fueled mistrust between the communities. Developments which could and should have been foreseen and avoided by good faith dialogue. The Kosovo Serb community representatives have shared their feelings that they are faced with human rights challenges. These, as well as the frequent use of inflammatory and derogatory rhetoric in both directions, demand close attention and scrutiny, as well as responsible remedial action by those in leadership positions. During a time when international political and financial investments continue to be made in support of good faith dialogue, unilateral action, particularly concerning matters that lie clearly within the scope of the dialogue process, cannot help to alleviate the concerns among ordinary people. The various agreements reached thus far through the dialogue process provide a clear roadmap toward the settling of many of these outstanding issues. Regardless of which side undertakes unilateral actions or the justifications provided for doing so, in the end, such actions only perpetuate an environment of insecurity and mistrust between the communities. To build upon my remarks delivered on 8th of February in this Council, I must reiterate my continued concerns, also expressed by several member states, about the manner in which the new regulation on cash transactions was communicated and implemented, and how it has affected the more vulnerable segments of the non-majority community. Under the facilitation of the European Union, the parties have met five times. On the 27th of February, 19th and 25th of March, 4th and 18th of April, to seek a solution that addresses the concerns raised and mitigate unintended consequences. We should remain hopeful that a solution can be reached while urging the parties to work together to find practical solutions in the nearest future. Another element of the main agreements which can provide solutions for this and other outstanding normalization matters is the taking of earnest 
credible steps towards establishing the association community of Serb majority municipalities. Whatever the community municipalities as final form, that form clearly will encompass the elements of sustainable financial and institutional guarantees for the Kosovo Serb community. This includes matters of local administration, along with essential basic services like education and healthcare. Repeated calls for its establishment should be heeded, as it will serve as an important step towards fostering trust between the Serb community and central authority. Madam President, the full implementation of the EU facilitated agreements has become an ever more pressing priority in order to help alleviate the continued series of crises that have emerged. It is therefore of utmost importance for both sides to remain committed to constructive, good faith engagement and that they find practical compromises. Madam President, on matters where implementation of essential agreements has advanced, meaningful results have been accomplished during this same time frame. These include advances on vehicle license plate validity, steps forward on the energy roadmap and on the customs. I wish to commend the Pristina leadership for taking action to fully implement the High Court decision of 2016, affirming the property rights of the Vizoki de Chani Monastery, which had previously languished for many years. Such action is to be welcomed, since it significantly contributes to both intercommunity trust as well as public confidence in the rule of law. Madam President, UNMIC will continue to make full use of its resources in partnership with you and Kosovo team and our implementing partners to help the communities to overcome existing mistrust and to find opportunities for reaping the benefits of genuine cooperation. We will continue to seek support to, to work across multiple fields that create new space for communities to work jointly to positively influence processes that affect the future of all. This remains a pillar of our mandated work. The mission has utilized its essential programmatic activities resources to facilitate innovation and collaboration to encourage greater mutual trust between the communities, find common ground and establish more widespread tolerance to Kosovo's diversity. Madam President, in this context, the Barabar Center continues to carry out just such efforts at the grassroots level. Since my last report to you, the number of the center's major activities has surpassed 70 over the course of less than one year, engaging with more than 4,000 individuals representing all communities in Kosovo. To help inspire champions of trust building in Kosovo, in November, we conducted the second United Nations Kosovo Trust Building Forum, involving participants from all communities and professions who agreed upon 27 recommendations and many more related actions in six thematic areas, economic empowerment, environmental protection, language rights, media and misinformation, participation and inclusion, and strengthening the rule of law. More innovative initiatives lie ahead in collaboration and with mutual support with our many international and local partners. Madam President, the promotion and protection of human rights is a fundamental part of UNMIC's mandated work. Together with our partners, we continue to encourage the authorities to place 
human rights and rule of law principles at the heart of sound policy judgments. This apply to a wide range of human rights and freedom, including rights to equality and non-discrimination, language, minority, and property rights, as well as freedoms of movement, expression, religion, and assembly. The enjoyment of these rights and freedoms is indispensable in sustaining Kosovo's multi-ethnic society. Madam President, on matters of transitional justice and the right to truth, I welcome the resumption of meetings of the working group on missing persons with the first meeting in three years, having been successfully held on the 31st of January 2024. This direct engagement must continue. During this period, UNMI continued to extend its support to the Legal Aid Center and the Kosovo Law Institute, assisting hundreds of vulnerable individuals, conducted specialized training for young Kosovo Serb lawyers to enhance their work in pursuit of the rule of law, and sponsored law students at a legal clinic promoting multi-ethnic media work. Madam President, while progress has been made in the legal and policy frameworks to address gender-based violence, the need for enhanced cooperation remains between government, civil society, and international organization. The mission will continue to employ proactive measures, strengthen support services, train professionals, raise awareness, and empower women and girls towards full implementation and comprehensive implementation of women, peace, and security agenda. The mission also continued to prioritize the youth, peace, and security agenda. In this regard, the sixth UN Youth Assembly in Kosovo this May will again serve as a platform to gather young activists and leaders from across community in Kosovo and from around the region. The Assembly will support cross-community dialogue and entrepreneurship to help meet the challenges and opportunities of an AI-powered world. Madam President, allow me to add a further point of critical emphasis, namely that to achieve progress in Kosovo and fulfill our mandated goals effectively, the issues we and our partners tackle must be understood and treated as part of the wider regional context. We are aware that our work is part of a combined international effort to promote prosperity, stability, and peace in Kosovo and beyond. Madam President, I wish to express my appreciation for the daily cooperation and support we receive from our major multilateral partners, in particular K4, and the strength of our coordination with you and Kosovo team. Together, and with your continuing support, we will navigate this challenging period by maintaining foremost our focus on the rights and well-being of people. We will continue to call upon all leaders, political and civic, to meet their obligation in the same respect. Similarly, we will continue to give our full support to prioritize dialogue over unilateral actions or zero-sum divisive rhetoric. Acknowledging the trends of setbacks in overall trust, we will remain as determined partners to all who share the foresight for a better future. Good faith dialogue, communication, and mutual understanding mark the path forward. Progress is born from actions undertaken with the willingness to forge compromises. That's the progress. Madam President, I conclude by extending my deep appreciation to you and to all of you, distinguished members of the Council, for your continued support. 
Such support is indispensable to unmix continued endeavors to strengthen the conditions for a peaceful and normal life for all people in Kosovo, linked inextricably to peace in the region and, I, and beyond. And I thank you, Madam President. I thank Ms. Yadeh for her briefing. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Ms. Alexander Vucic, President of the Republic of Serbia. Dear Madam President, esteemed members of the Security Council, dear Special Representative of the Secretary General, allow me, before I move to the report we are speaking about today, to remind you that on 19th of April was exactly 11 years since the most important agreement between Belgrade and Pristina on the path of normalization of relations was adopted in Brussels. One of the signatories was also the European Union. Eleven years later, even though Serbs met all the difficult obligations from the mentioned agreement, the community of Serb-majority municipalities and its formation are not even on the horizon. For all the Serbs living in Kosovo and Metohija, for the entire Serbia, these 11 years have been 11 years of undelivered promises, daily excuses and untruths. 11 years of accidental or intentional inability of the EU as the guarantor of the respective agreement to move things from square one. Of course, all that resulted in what we can call today the legal violence and physical harassment of Serbian population in Kosovo and Metohija. First and foremost, I extend my gratitude to Secretary General Guterres and Special Representative Ziade for their dedication to fulfilling the UNMIC mandate as outlined in UN Security Council Resolution 1244. And therefore, while the subject report may not fully capture the severity of the situation on the ground, it actually documents nearly all significant events during the reporting period, and this holds considerable value for Member States. To gain a more comprehensive understanding of this report, I wish to highlight certain critical points for the esteemed members of this body to consider. The report on UNMIX work that is before us today is being discussed month and a half since this distinguished body held a special session on situation in Kosovo and Metohija on February the 8th. Let me remind you that this urgent session was held upon submission by the Republic of Serbia, that the provisional institutions of self-government in Kosovo, led by the Albanian leadership, are jeopardizing international peace and stability. To that submission, the Republic of Serbia also enclosed the detailed explanation of actions by which the provisional institutions continuously and intentionally created the unbearable living conditions for Serbs and other non-Albanians. Additionally, the Republic of Serbia presented to the Security Council all the actions by which those institutions carry out well-planned, widespread and systematic harassment attacks against Serb civilians, including continuous legal violence physical violence and selective targeting. Urgent Security Council session on 8th of February was held thanks to the fact that all members of the Security Council evaluated that our arguments in the submitted complaint had been based on facts and in accordance with that they approved our request. Especially emphasize that the majority which accepted our argumentation consisted here of the countries that do not respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Republic of Serbia in a way envisaged by the provisions of the legally binding UN Security Council Resolution 1244. Thereby, it is much more important that such a structure of the Security Council member states respected our arguments and took into consideration on this important session the ethnically motivated intentional creation of unbearable living conditions for Serbs as well as the campaign of well-planned, widespread and systematic harassment against Serb civilians. And their persecution by the provisional institutions of self-government in Kosovo. 
I will remind you that almost all members of this distinguished body express profound concern for the position of Serbs and other non-Albanians in Kosovo and Metohija and had urged for the dialogue. During those discussions, special emphasis was placed on the acute measure of abolishing cash transactions in dinars whereby Serbian dinars, whereby Pristina's regime dramatically and additionally made daily life of Serbs and other non-Albanians difficult, given that they predominantly received their income in dinars. This issue was discussed in the context of denying them access to even basic social services such as health care, education, etc. However, said measure to abolish the use of DINA representing the culmination of protracted, comprehensive and ethnically motivated campaign of widespread and systematic attacks against non-Albanian civilians where Pristina's institutions is still effective. If you remember, Albin Kurti was speaking here in front of all of you that he was giving to Serbs the three-month transitional period in which no Serb rights would be abused regarding giving and accepting dinars as a currency. Of course, since the moment session ended, no one in Pristina or in the international community has ever mentioned three-month transitional period, and all the measures against Serbs related to dinar started being implemented immediately. That is why Serbs and other non-Albanian population in Kosovo and Metohija remains unable to get their pensions, salaries, social giving, child allowances, and all other payments, and why the work of schools, kindergartens, medical, social, and all other institutions is practically disrupted. Employees of those institutions, those that are still operating, face daily fears from groundless apprehensions which Kurti's regime is carrying out on a mass scale under false charges. This situation profoundly affects children in kindergartens, pensioners, single mothers, and severely ill persons in rural environments, but also everyone else. This issue stands out as one of the few where Pristina authorities demonstrate lack of discrimination affecting every, everyone equally, regardless of their age or gender, as long as they are non-Albanian and do not endorse their chauvinistic agenda aimed at realizing the Greater Albania concept. And yet instead of being sanctioned, Kurti's regime keeps being rewarded. I would like to take this opportunity to inform all member states who have sincerely and with good intentions called for dialogue that from February the 8th, 2024 to the present day, five rounds of discussions have been held in Brussels based on UN Security Council Resolution 1244 and General Assembly Resolution 64298 from 2010. The only tangible outcome of these deliberations has been the exposure of Pristina's true motives. Pristina's head negotiator, Bislimi, Albin Kurti's deputy and his partner in the persecution of the civilian population, confirmed that their unilateral and escalatory decision to effectively abolish the dinner in Kosovo and Metohija has profoundly affected the people. And unlike Kurti's assertions made before this esteemed body that Serbia's accusation was false, and that no one, including Serbs, was impacted by, the, by their decision, Bislimi's sincerity acknowledged that the actual intentions to eradicate all Serbian presence in Kosovo and Metohija. Therefore, he, like Kurti, remained committed to greater Albania hegemonic aspirations, which preclude any negotiations with Serbia and coexistence with Serbs. His conduct in the dialogue process, characterized by a strategy of sabotage through presence, underscored his reluctance to pursue a compromise solution, as had been advocated by this esteemed body, to safeguard the population. And yet, instead of being sanctioned, Kurti's regime keeps being rewarded. Ladies and gentlemen, in parallel, Pristina's brutal repression in persecuting Serbs and other non-Albanian has been additionally deepened and strengthened. Since the urgent session, 16 new ethnically motivated attacks against Serbs took place. They involve, number one, armed attack against Serb young men in Gracanica. Number two, gun firing and intimidation of ever smaller number of Serb returnees in the west of Kosovo. Number three, continuing unjustified detentions. Number four, police violent removal of the plates, which names of the places in Serbian language, in Cyrillic alphabet, in purely Serb municipalities in the north of Kosovo. 
Continuous attacks within the campaign of Serb persecution broadened after 8 of February to intrusions of Pristina's parapolice forces into Serbian pharmacies in Kosovska Mitrovica and Zubin Potok, where the persecutors of Serbs confiscated huge amounts of medications. On the other hand, while the ANMIC report maintains factual precision, it lacks in capturing the interconnected events over an extended period of time. These events, when analyzed together, paint a stark picture of the ground reality. This limitation in reporting stems not only from the length of the reporting period, but also from the methodology employed, which has remained consistently superficial and brief. Therefore, it is my obligation, esteemed representatives of the Member States, to offer further insight into the, report, into the reported events, enabling you to grasp the overall situation more comprehensively. Due to security, Council emergency session is not presented in the report as an event of special relevance. The respective session was mentioned only in item 22, and even there it has been wrongly put that it had been held at Serbia's request to discuss the consequences of the new currency regulation. This claim is factually incorrect because Serbian quest was for emergency session adopted by the UN Security Council had been based on complaint supported by arguments for endangering international peace and security by Pristina. Illegal abolishment of dinner was reported and took into consideration in that context only as a part of complaint against Pristina authorities. Four, number one, systematic, widespread and well-planned attacks against Serbs by Pristina. Number two, intentional creation of unbearable level, living conditions for Serbs. And number three, persecution of Serbs. The dramatic complaint on persecution of Serbs, which SC took into consideration at the emergency session, was blandly and prosaically presented in the report in the following way. Mr. Vucic and Mr. Kurti participated in the session presenting contrasting narratives regarding the situation in Kosovo and the regulation and the regulation's impact. In that regard, I believe that it is important to remind that Serbia was not presenting just some narrative at the respective session, quite the opposite. Our address was the mere numbering of concrete data and facts on the campaign of systematic, well-planned and widespread Pristina's attack against her population. On that occasion, I mentioned, among other things, concrete data on the following. The illegal expropriation of more than one million square meters of Serbian land for construction of an illegal basis of special police in the north of Kosovo. Disabling freedom of movement for, Serbi for Serbs by meaningless stoppings humiliating treatment, beatings, and even other acts of violence at illegal armed checkpoints and at other places throughout the north of Kosovo and Metohija. Arbitrary apprehensions of dozens of feminine Serbs, as well as unfounded long custody based only on their ethnicity and without raising charges. Meaningless shooting by Pristina special forces and almost constant presence of armored vehicles in a peaceful urban environments making decisions on confiscating buildings owned by Serbian institutions which have been owning them for more than a century. Introduction on the nine months illegal embargo on Serbian goods and seizures of legal goods owned by Serbian merchants. Violent confiscation of the property of the Serbian Orthodox Church whereby Pristina violates special protective zones around the Serbian Orthodox Church facilities while renaming Serbian sacral facilities which are several centuries old to Albanian ones. Ploughing and destruction of Serbian cemeteries, arming illegal so-called Kosovo security forces, which in accordance with paragraph 9b, paragraph 15, and article 6, annex 1 of the UNSC resolution 1244 should be demilitarized and dismantled. Disabling payment of 60,946 salaries and pensions to Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija. 2,430 scholarships for students and pupils, funds for financing soup kitchens for about 2,000 socially most vulnerable citizens, as well as all other incomes for Serbs, 470 unsanctioned ethnically motivated attacks against Serbs, 75 attacks against sacred facilities of the Serbian Orthodox Church, 25 attacks against Serbian children, including attempt of murder of the 11 years old Serb child by the representative of the illegal Kosovo security forces on Christmas 2023 and his cousin of 21 
years old. And yet, instead of being sanctioned, Kurti's regime in Pristina keeps being rewarded. We cannot count the number of times the events in Banska have been mentioned by various international officials, news outlets, and even in front of this council. On the other hand, not even and once of that zeal and energy has been used to raise the issue of the horrific crime committed by a soldier under the command of here present Lyosa Osmani, a uniformed soldier of the so-called KSF, who while on duty using his service rifle and on the eve of the Orthodox Christmas, cold-bloodedly shot an 11-year-old boy Stefan Stojanovic and his 21-year-old cousin Miloš Stojanovic. Sometimes we wonder whether the fact that he has only been charged for Mr. Menner is due to the fact that the victims were just ethnic Serbs. Let me remind you once again of Kurti's words pronounced here at the session of this distinguished body. The regulation does nothing to ban or prevent the government of Serbia from providing financial assistance to Kosovo Serbs. Each different suggestion is nothing but a false propaganda aimed at inciting ethnical tensions. The regulation strives only to provide transparency and legality of the cash that is being imported to Kosovo in accordance with our constitution and the EU monetary policy. The same rules apply to all cash imports from any country in any currency. They do not ban dinar transfers from Serbia. The proof that Kurti was lying to, the, to this distinguished body is also that a few days ago, the topic of the Brussels of Dialogue meeting was precisely how to resolve this problem. The solid proof is also a fact that the American Special Envoy for the Western Balkans stated on 14th of March in Pristina, more than a month after Kuti had lied to Security Council, that the issue of dinner was an emerging humanitarian issue that we need to address immediately. Mr. Escobar also said that he was moved by the stories of ordinary Serbs who were affected most directly by the ban of dinar. The American envoy said on that occasion that Albin Kurti had refused his plan for resolving that humanitarian issue. Asked by the media why Kurti had decided to proceed with the ban of dinar, knowing that this issue could have been resolved through the establishment of community of Serb majority municipalities, Mr. Escobar answered that it was the question for Kurti. Kurti lied before this council also when he was speaking about the alleged introduction of the three-month transition measures in reference to the decision on dinar currency, which did not happen, but new bans and repression followed instead. And yet, instead of being sanctioned, Kurti's regime keeps being rewarded. So all the aforementioned facts confirm that Pristina and Kurti have never told the truth but that Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija are the target of the well-planned, systematic and widespread harassment by Pristina's institutions aimed at their persecution. After the emergency SC session, this fact should have been clearly underlined in the report, alongside with the ambiguous condemnation of Pristina's violence. We do not expect ANMIC to tailor its reports to suit political desires and aspirations of any involved parties. On the contrary, we advocate for the reporting that is grounded solely on facts. Hence, we expect ANMIC to deliver clear and precise reports to the member states regarding state of affairs on the ground. Additionally, credible reporting does not imply neutrally and or ambiguity towards events that directly endanger the population in Kosovo. Such neutrality is unacceptably given that ANMIC is duty-bound as mandated by this esteemed body to clearly and loudly oppose any attempt to threaten the civilian population in the province. We also believe that the report misses information for the Security Council on concrete measures that the UN Security General Special Representative has taken in order to discourage, anticipate, disable or sanction Pristina's violence and persecution of Serbs and other non-Albanians. Let me remind you the international civil presence headed by the Special Representative has obligation to secure normal life in Kosovo. Paragraph 10 of the Resolution 1244 clearly reads that the Secretary General is authorized to establish international civil presence, among other things, in order to oversee the development of provisional democratic self-governing institutions and to ensure conditions for peaceful and normal life for all inhabitants of Kosovo. We had been listening for years that a special representative had transferred their authorizations to the provisional institutions of self-government and that there was no legal basis for him or her to take other actions. 
However, let me remind the Security Council that those competencies were transferred to the provisional institutions by the special representative through constitutional framework of provisional self-government in Kosovo. This document was enacted precisely by the UN Security General's special representative on 15th of May 2001 and in accordance with mandate outlined in UNSC Resolution 1244 via Regulation No. 2001 -9, and it remains legally binding. Furthermore, Chapter 12 of the UNMI Constitutional Framework states as follows. The exercise of the responsibilities of the provisional institutions under this constitutional framework shall not affect or diminish the authority of the SRSG to ensure full implementation of UN SCR 1244, including overseeing the provisional institutions of self-government, its officials and its agencies, and taking appropriate measures whenever their actions are inconsistent with UN SCR 1244 or this constitutional framework. Therefore, it is undisputable that the UN SG Special Representative has the explicit obligation to report on the concrete measures she has taken to stop and disable ethnically motivated persecution of population in accordance with the UN Security Council Resolution 1244, or at least to offer explanation why she failed to take such measures, if that is the case. Instead, like I said, what we have is enumerating of almost all individual cases in this report, but other lack of clear context of persecution of civilians that is taking place in reality in the ground, which was discussed at a Security Council emergency session. However, while the emergency session of the Security Council was mentored, mentioned only once and attacks against civilians within Pristina's campaign of their persecution, no even once, tragic development in Banska village of 24 September were mentioned for a total of eight times in this report. That is why I need to reiterate what I said at the emergency session of the Security Council and which refers to the conclusion that those developments were not caused by the consequence of Kurti's repression and persecution of civilians. Serbia unambiguously condemned the violence in Banska that very evening, and that is why it will not allow that this tragedy is used as an alibi for persecuting Serbs, as well as for diverting the attention from the fact that this persecution takes place in the ground on a daily basis. Let me remind you that for more than a year prior to tragic events, the Republic of Serbia had been publicly warning of all international representatives that Serbs in Kosovo had been facing systematic and widespread attacks and violence of Kurtis chauvinistic regime. Since autumn 2021, Serbs have been completely excommunicated from the political economic system of the so-called Kosovo. Serbian police envisaged by Article 9 of the Brussels Agreement was replaced with Kurtis mono-ethnic paramilitary formations that are harassing, beating up and apprehending. Nobody wanted to listen to our pleas to stop the terror. Pristina has been systematically undermining life and elementary rights of the Serbian people. Let me remind you that Pristina organized then in Serb-majority municipalities shameful elections, which Serbs boycotted for violation of their rights and for endangering their safety through Kurti's illegal replacement of the regional police commander. Even though only 0029 percent Serbs voted in those elections, and Serbs constitute 95 percent of the population there. New Albanian municipal authorities were confirmed and appointed with complete absence of any legitimacy. Then they came to the head office of those Serbian municipalities as true procurators follow, followed by heavily armed Kosovo special police units. What followed then is the brutal terror against the Serbs who are now being terrorized by the special police forces while illegitimate Albanian municipal officials make and implement decisions that are directly against the interests of the Serbs. And yet instead of being sanctioned, Kurti's regime keeps being rewarded. In spite of the declarative international calls to end this situation, Pristina persistently continues with the occupation of the North and disables the election of legitimate local authorities. After false promises that it would revoke illegitimate Albanian officials, it requested a petition from Serbs for the replacement of the respective authorities in order to organize the referendum for revoking them. In order to make such a referendum a successful one, it takes turn out of more than 50% registered voters and Serbs had initial, initially agreed to organize signing of the mentioned petition and gathered more than 20% required voters' signatures. 
so six times more than number of votes by which some Albanian officials were elected. In order to prevent revoking and maintain favorable conditions for continued persecution of Serbs by manipulating with the voter lists, Pristina suddenly increased the number of registered voters. It was done in the period when more than 15% majority Serb population escaping from the repression left the province. That is why there were 46,249 voters in voter list of those four municipalities today, which is 5.7% more than in 2021. Between October 2021 and March 2024, 2,498 new voters were added and number of Albanian voters was artificially increased by 12.42%. If one adds to that the disabling of voting by mail for the expelled persons, but also the campaign of intimidation and blackmails against the Serbs not to take part in such a referendum, it is obvious that Pristina intends to finalize the persecution of Serbs with the support of illegitimate municipal authorities. That is why the recent decision made by the Serbs to boycott such a referendum is quite understandable and the only possible one, because they are disabled to reach the set threshold of 50% registered voters by being persecuted, banned to vote outside Kosovo and by registering Albanian voters not living there. In parallel, Pristina threatens Serbs with tax sanctions, financial sanctions of 2,000 euros if they refuse the call for census. It carries out arbitrary apprehensions and all other kinds of physical and institutional violence. Speaking of arbitrary apprehensions of Serbs, which, by the way, were marked as unacceptable by the European Union, but also speaking of false guarantees of international community that there would be no apprehensions of Serbs for taking part in protests, allow me to mention on the most recent case. On April 14th, Pristina Special Forces arrested Srećko Sofronijević, Serb from Zvečan, whom they wounded in the back from automatic weapons in 2021. He was wounded at the political protests of Serbs against the illegal intrusion of those units in the north of Kosovo, where in accordance with Article 9 of the first agreement from 2013, they should not come without approval by Serbs. Sofronijević hardly survived the shooting, for which none of the members of Pristina Special Forces was called for accountability, and let alone sanctioned. Instead, Sofronijević was arrested a few days ago and placed to custody on charges for a violation of the so-called constitutional order of the fake state and the so-called Kosovo. He is a man who has never made any offense or anything else and who spent all this time of Pristina's terror in his hometown and his house. When he was arrested, of course, he was accompanied by his wife. Despite all that, Pristina apprehended him on charges for the aforementioned offense. We have since received reports about further physical abuse of Sofronijević upon his reception to the Albanian majority-run prison in Podajevo. At the same time, one of Kurti's co-perpetrators of persecution of Serbs and the minister in his government, Liburna Liu, declared the following in December 2023. The independent state of Kosovo is a temporary project. This, this is a citation. A Kosovo nation cannot be created. So the innocent and Shots of Ranijevic is imprisoned for the alleged violation of some constitutional order, and Aliyu is still free occupying one of the highest-ranking positions in Pristina. That much about the apprehensions and persecution of Serbs as a part of some alleged non-selective implementation of the law. Those who are friends and supporters of Pristina are the only ones believing in this kind of the rule of law. Serbia demands the immediate release of all political prisoners held by Pristina's regime. There cannot be reconciliation without liberation of all political prisoners. Let me remind you that Serbia has adopted several times the amnesty law according to which thousands of KLA terrorists, including Albin Kurti, were set free. Speaking of the rule of law, the biggest opponent of the so-called Kosovo's constitution is not us in Belgrade, but precisely Kurti regime. It might seem unusual to you, but this is not exaggeration, but easily verifiable fact. The Brussels agreement was ratified with a two-third majority in the so-called Kosovo's parliament, and it derogates all other legal norms, and yet again, Kurti and his associates publicly refu refuse to implement the foundation provisions of this agreement. The Constitution guarantees the equality of Serbian language and Cyrillic alphabet, which is omitted. The Constitution envisages that one ministry should be led by the party that wins the majority among the Serbs, which has been completely neglected. And yet, instead of being sanctioned, Kurti's regime keeps being rewarded. In other words, while everybody has been 
talking and reporting for months on situation in Kosovo through wrong interpretation of the events in Banska. What we have in the ground is the continuation of open and unsanctioned persecution of Serbs in formally peaceful terms while not having a single action to stop that crime against humanity, just like it is confirmed by this report. Dear President, distinguished members, UN Security Council is one among only few international forums before one can discuss in arguments and openly about the situation in Kosovo. To tell you the truth, there are less and less opportunities to do so. Because the representatives of Pristina with wholehearted political advisory and logistic help from their international sponsors by making small steps impose as the perfect act something that is not normal and that is inadmissible from the position of the international law and something that must be accepted calmly. The United Nations, as the last instance and the bastion of defense of international law, cannot allow ambiguous flexibility in evaluating dramatic crimes against some population because thereby the system founded on the UN Charter undermines itself and its own authority. Today we need strong and principled United Nations more than ever. And the situation in Kosovo and Metohi is a good opportunity for the World Organization to strengthen its authority. In addition to insisting on clear condemnation and termination of persecution of Serbs, the Republic of Serbia underlines once again that it is fully committed to the belgrade pristina dialogue as the only peaceful way for overcoming disagreements and resolving problems. Persistent refusal by Pristina to consistently implement almost any out of totally 52 reached political agreements is the additional evidence that Pristina persecutes Serbs with clear premeditation. In other words, those agreements were designed and reached precisely that the relations between Belgrade and Pristina could normalize in time and that all people during this political process could live their normal life in reality. It involves also Serbs in Kosovo to which the agreements from 2011 guarantee a dozen specific solutions for protection of their anyway difficult position in dominantly Albanian environment. As a credible and responsible partner, to that aim, Belgrade had delivered its commitments from the dialogue long time ago. By doing so, it had been continuously making very painful concessions, among other things, that Serbs in Kosovo could enjoy peace, safety, and respect for fundamental rights. Contrary to that, Serbs have been exposed to open persecution for years, and while preparing that persecution for 11 years, Pristina refused and still refuses to implement its most important committed commitment from the dialogue. That commitment refers to the need of consistent establishment of the community with Serb-majority municipalities, as agreed by agreements from 2013 and 2015, as the mechanism for protection of individual and collective rights of Serbs in the province as the foundation of the entire normalization process and all other agreed agreements. Let me make it clear, Belgrade's insisting on the ASM or CSM is without any prejudice to the status of Kosovo and Metohija. This is about institutional solution that would anticipate it and disable persecution of Serbs that has been carried out in the past years. It is meant for enabling safe life in the ground, economic development and protection of elementary political rights of Serbs. If the ASM were established in the past 11 years, I'm certain that it would create favorable conditions for the true dialogue and historical reconciliation between the communities. However, this is precisely what those who are in power in Pristina do not want. The reason is that they are guided by ethnic hatred towards the Serbs, which they use for inciting international tensions and as an excuse for finalizing the persecution and ethnic cleansing of Serbs. That is the only reason why they are against the formation of the ASM in accordance with agreements from 2013 and 2015, hoping that by successive cancellation of rights and creation of unbearable living conditions for survival of Serbian people, this would be leave Kosovo and Metohija, whereby the idea of the ASM would be pointless. Unfortunately, the obvious is not obvious in this report, too. I reiterate very well-known factual data in neutrally given data on place, time and topics of the dialogue meetings that are very well known to all of us will not end persecution of Serbs, lead to the stabilization of circumstances and force Pristina not to undermine the dialogue and finally implement its obligations. In that sense, it's really high time that we perceive that if population in Kosovo cannot really cannot rely either on the United Nations as the objective arbiter and someone that will prevent Pristina's cunning ethnic engineering I'm afraid that it brings us to the possibility of unpredictable scenarios with immense consequences. In order to eliminate, to, to eliminate 
Given the slightest possibility that such a development does not take place, we believe that it is necessary that the special representative exercise her authorizations and supervises the provisional institutions of self-government, but also to take urgent actions in cooperation with K4 aimed at ensuring safety and human rights to all inhabitants of Kosovo. Simply said, it is obvious that we urgently need a solution that means more unmic, not less. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, pogrom against the Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija has been lasting since 1999 until today. Let me remind you to some of unpunished crimes committed in the presence and before the eyes of the UN international forces with predominant participation of the same countries that committed the aggression against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. In July 1999, Albanian terrorists massacred 14 Serbian farmers from Starogradsko village near Lipljan. In February 2001, a bus taking Serbs displaces from Kosovo and Metohija to visit the graves of their loved ones was blown up. 12 Serbs were killed and 43 of them were wounded in that attack. In 2003, Albanian terrorists in Gorazdovac were shooting at Serbian children who were swimming in Bistrica River, and two children were killed then, while several were severely wounded. The culmination of evil was the pogrom against the Serbian people in March 2004, when 16 Serbs were killed. Hundreds were injured, about 4,000 expelled. Six towns and nine villages experienced ethnical cleansing. More than 800 facilities, including 35 Orthodox churches, and monasteries were destroyed or severely damaged. And the balance of 25 years of the alleged peace is almost a quarter of a million Serbs and other non-Albanians that are still expelled and internally displaced. They don't seem to have right to a sustainable return because the creators of the apparent peace estimated that it is easier to integrate those people into environments where they are against their will than to create functional multi-ethnic society in Kosovo. If we translate this into daily language, it is obvious that everything has been tolerated for Albanian extremism in the past 25 years and in such a way that the ideologists and ex executors of the politics of evil and persecution of Serbs are not isolated and punished but rewarded. Not only that no one who ordered these crimes was brought to justice, but on the 20th anniversary of the March pogrom, that chauvinistic regime offered again the same lie on the drowning of three boys in Chabra village which initiated the inevitable wave of violence, murders, robberies, and expelling. It is clear to everyone that the aim of this was to justify the violence, but at the same time the invitation for repetition of crimes that have taken place on that fatal 17th March. And yet, instead of being sanctioned, Kurtis regime keeps being rewarded. Commitment to peace is not a predominant state of the mind in Kosovo. Political elite in Pristina does not think of peace as of the value and their obsession is consolidation at any cost of what they see as an independent state. And they are carrying out that project now by persecuting Serbs and other non-Albanians, not caring for the lives of the people. Distinguished members of this council should know that Albin Kurti is not here today because he is busy undermining regional stability, since he is personally at the forefront of his party's campaign for elections in neighboring North Macedonia. And imagine, the most popular politician in Macedonia is not Albin Kurti, it's Aleksandar Vucic, President of Serbia, but not having any kind of campaign in North Macedonia. As the President of Serbia, I'm sorry that our citizen acts in this way in the international arena. I want to convey to the people of North Macedonia that interfering in their internal matters is not the politics of Serbia, but of our irresponsible citizen Albin Kurti. We will certainly have the opportunity today to listen to fairy tales from those from Pristina who ordered pogrom against the Serbs about the so-called Kosovo as the champion of democracy. We are deeply disappointed that the Tomic report that is before us today does not provide sufficient foundations to, the, to claim the opposite. But as the President of Serbia, UN Member State, facing secessionist movement in its southern province, I am obliged not to make compromise with the truth and not use euphemism for the actual state in the ground. Even though today's session is dedicated to the concrete six-month report on UNMIX work, I must warn you not only to the danger resulting from revitalizing the hatred politics carried out by Pristina, but also to the danger brought before the international legal order by the operation of printing Pristina that is self-declared Kosovo to membership of the Council of Europe. The final of this mockery against the international law is planned for mid-May, and that is why we can easily find ourselves in a situation where 
chauvinistic regime which is carrying out persecution of the entire nation is rewarded for their actions. And precisely by the organization whose sense and proclaimed objective is to promote and protect the rule of law and to protect human rights and freedoms. For creating already in details described apartheid system in the heart of Europe, Kurti's regime was rewarded with visa liberalization, probable membership to the Council of Europe, and what's even worse, by arming the illegal armed forces for which this Council established that they should not exist. In the meantime, what is the world doing? The world is silent because the politics of democracy, the development and preservation of multicultural and multi-ethnic society for which the Western countries taxpayers gave billions is replaced by the politics of consolidation of the so-called Kosovo statehood. With the Council of Europe membership, Kurti would be directly rewarded with political support for the next so-called Kosovo elections, having in mind that the opposition following the Quint advice publicly called on Pristina not to apply for membership to the Council of Europe. It turns out that Kurti will get another victory served on a plate. Implementation of the decision on property of Dechani Monastery is actually the best indicator what kind of a banana republic we speak about. The only reason why the judgment on Dechani has been finally implemented after 11 years is faking the tolerance towards the church, while for the past two years the land of the size of two states of Vatican was taken away from Serbs in the north, though expropriation which is illegal, even in accordance with the so-called Kosovo laws. That is why I warned this body member states as well as all other bodies of the United Nations to have in mind that there are plans that the same model of blind denial of reality is implemented also within the UN and all with the aim to make perpetrators of persecution against the Serbs happy, as well as to meet political interests of the powerful ones. If that would ever occur, it would beyond any doubt be the final and the fatal blow to international law that would inflict the irreparable damage to the UN system and international order based on equality and sovereignty of member states of the World Organization. Fortunately, I'm almost certain that such demolishing plans will not be achieved because there is a convincing majority of those who blindly observe international law, UN Charter and all SC resolutions, including Resolution 1244, which guarantees territorial integrity of the Republic of Serbia, with the territory of Kosovo and Metohija as its part. I want to urge on the conscience on the countries that supported the independence of the so-called Kosovo, a project that you had presented to the world and your domestic public as the future model of liberal democracy, multi-ethnicity and multiculturalism, is galloping today towards mono-ethnic despotism cleaned of all minorities. By giving priority to the consolidation of the so-called Kosovo statehood in terms in which basic collective political, economic, but also individual rights of Serbs and other non-Albanians are being violated, you sentenced anyway the illegal project of the so-called Kosovo's independence to moral death. And just to add one more sentence, we were accused for many months in numbers of international medias that we were just about to launch an aggression like it is possible to be done by someone who acts on its own territory against Kosovo or some other nations in the region. And no one was saying sorry or excuse us for these terrible lies and falsities. And I wanted to reassure you that Serbia is very much committed and fully devoted to peace, international public order, UN resolution, and to the dialogue process under the auspices of European Union, and we'll do our best to keep calm and tranquility in the region. And you can always count on Serbia's seriousness and responsible approach to this issue. Thank you for listening to me. I thank His Excellency Mr. Vucic for his statement. And now I give the floor to Ms. Vioza Asmani Sadrio. Thank you, Madam President, esteemed members of the Council, ladies and gentlemen. The history of humankind has been shaped by our collective response in the face of aggression, tyranny and oppression. As an organization founded on the ruins of war, the United Nations, upon its creation, committed to protecting the human rights from the scourge of destruction. It was meant to bring the world under one roof, 
to not only discuss but also to reflect, to not only meet but also to cooperate, to not only adopt resolutions but also to deliver. At the very foundations of the United Nations lays the ambition for a better, peaceful and equitable world through invoking primarily and exclusively a human-centered policy approach. Today, as I stand here representing my country, the Republic of Kosovo, I'm reminded of the profound impact that democracies uniting for a common purpose have had in my country and in my people. It was only 25 years ago when NATO's intervention, coupled with the people's unwavering aspiration for freedom and liberty, marked not just a decisive turn in our country's history, but also a decisive milestone in the history of humankind. That intervention was not just about building peace. It was principally and most importantly about protecting the sanctity of human life and the rights of all people to live free from fear of destruction and persecution. It underscored the imperative that when one of us is threatened by tyranny, it is a threat to us all. It reminded us of the indispensability of acting as a united force in the face of grave injustice through protecting human lives at all costs. 25 years later, Kosovo shines as a resounding success and advocate for democratic values, embracing diversity, promoting multi-ethnicity, and advancing human rights for all. We have come a long way ever since, and we are witnessing an extraordinary and inspiring transform transformation. Our young republic has not only overcome the ravages of war, but has turned into an outstanding example of democracy in action, fueled by the vibrant spirit of our youth and the unwavering commitment of our people. Kosovo's global footprint in sports, the realm of music and film, in the Bergen ICT sector and equally so in science and innovation, driven by artists, sports people, innovators, students, entrepreneurs and other professionals alike, is expanding and becoming more historic and impactful with every passing day. Each of these achievements encapsulates the essence of a people reborn, a people that thrives on hope, works with passion and dreams with courage, paving the way toward a full future with possibilities and successes. Our history also exemplifies how our strength lies in the power of our alliances. We have made great strides because of our steadfast resolve to raise from the ashes of war, but equally so because of the support, the guidance from, and the partnerships we've built with countries that stood by us and with us during our darkest days. As a thriving and an ever more prosperous democracy, it is rule of law that stands as the core of every institutional undertaking as best exemplified through our everyday endeavors to combat crime and corruption, ensure transparency, and guarantee justice for all. Our efforts have not gone in vain, as they have been widely recognized by some of the most prestigious global indices, like Freedom House Report, VDEM Democracy Reports, Reporters Without Borders, World Press Freedom Index, Transparency International, and many more. At only 16 years old, the Republic of Kosovo remains the most pro-EU and pro-NATO country in the region and beyond. We understand that by joining this alliance, we not only have a chance to sit side by side with some of our greatest allies to engage in joint solutions to the benefits of global peace and security, but to also engage on the longevity and sustainability of peace and security in our region as well as at home. With a post-pandemic double-digit economic growth and an average annual growth of 6.2% in the span of past three years, Kosovo is also witnessing a promising economic prospect spurred by the doubled exports and foreign direct investment. Kosovo is not just prospering within its borders. We have steadfastly turned into a reliable international partner, one that no longer stands merely on the receiving end. 
whether through our co-deployment missions with armies of our allied nations contributing to peace around the world or by stepping up to help Ukraine, Kosovo is showcasing that it is able, willing, and capable of giving back. In this spirit, we are claiming leadership in implementing global agendas to the benefit of the greater good. Just last week, Pristina turned in the, to the capital of global discussions on the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. As a woman president and as the commander-in-chief of the Kosovo Security Force and as a staunch believer in the power of women in transforming peace and security processes, I am confident that the WPS agenda can help lead our societies and our region to new heights. Through the just-launched Regional Center on Women, Peace and Security, supported by Secretary Blinken's office, we look forward to working with all the countries in our region, as well as with each and every one of you, to lead our collective efforts for building sustainable peace through putting women and girls at the heart of our collective endeavor. A Kosovo for all, one that promotes diversity, inclusivity, and representation. This is the Kosovo we work for every day. We do recognize, however, that we still have a lot of work to do. Because democracy, prosperity, and human rights should never be considered as finished projects. We should always strive for more and for better. We are committed to addressing the challenges together with our allies and partners by our side, guided by the highest international standards. Let me make it clear on the outset. Claims by Serbia on the alleged ethnic cleansing and persecution of Kosovo Serbs are false, baseless, and politically motivated. These narratives have also been thoroughly discredited by the Helsinki Committee for Human Rights all the way to the European Parliament and many other international organizations. Kosovo's legal and institutional structures not only protect but actively advance the rights and security of the Kosovo Serb community as well as all of the other communities, promoting an inclusive society where all citizens are encouraged to thrive. By contrast, about 500,000 Serbs, about half a million, have left Serbia during Vucic's reign in the past couple of years, according to Eurostat. So it should be rather clear to us who the Serbs are actually running away from. Kosovo Serbs, who make up about 3 to 4 percent of our population, are granted unparalleled legislative influence, such as the veto power over constitutional amendments and over every essential law concerning education, religion, local governance, human rights, ethnic minority rights, etc. In practice, this veto ensures their interests are safeguarded even if 110 out of 120 members of our parliament would vote otherwise. So it's in the hands of those 10 Serb members to decide. The constitution and national laws ensure that the Serb language is recognized and used as an official language across all of Kosovo, providing education and all public services in Serbian language, affirming as such the community's linguistic rights. Equally so, as confirmed by credible independent reports, the Orthodox religious sites are provided the highest level of security, while the Orthodox Church enjoys particular protections under Kosovo laws. In fact, aside from a few isolated thefts common to all religious, cultural, and private sites, there have been no ethnically motivated attacks against the Orthodox Church for many, many years, as confirmed by NATO's presence in Kosovo, refuting any claims of ethnic or religious targeting. In fact, out of the 30 cases that have been registered in 2024, the vast majority of them have been against Albanians and one against the Roma community. Multi-ethnicity and multiculturalism are values which we cherish and we will defend at any cost, despite continuous disruptions and challenges caused by the violent and illegal interference of Serbia. Our commitment to building a Kosovo for all is no coincidence. It is grounded on our staunch belief that only a representative, inclusive, and open democracy is a sustainable democracy. 
But most importantly, it is grounded on our unwavering commitment to make sure that no one, no one ever endures or has to go through what we had to go through. Unfortunately, even after 25 years from the NATO, when NATO put an end to the genocidal campaign of Milosevic, the destabilization efforts and aggression by Serbia remain unfortunately ongoing and active. Over the past year, Serbia has escalated its constant aggression towards Kosovo, initially with the abduction of three Kosovar policemen within our territory, thereafter with attacks on Kosovar journalists, as well as the attack on 93 NATO soldiers, with some left with lifetime injuries. And the culmination was the act of aggression and the terrorist attack against Kosovo on September 24, 2023. Immediately thereafter, as stated by the White House, Serbia has deployed an unprecedented large military presence and artillery alongside our border with advanced artillery, tanks, and mechanized infantry units. Just a few days ago, they also tested their Irani drones exactly at the border with Kosovo. That's the kind of messages that they sent to their neighbors. Unfortunately, the perpetrators of both the September aggression against Kosovo, as well as the May attack against NATO, freely wander around Serbia to this day. Not only they have not been convicted, but they continue to receive lucrative financial contracts by no other than Vucic's government. Just last week, shortly after Kosovo's resounding success at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, a human rights organization, Serbia escalated tensions by targeting buses carrying Kosovo citizens, including both Albanians as well as Serbs who work for Kosovo institutions. They confiscated personal documents and subjected individuals to prolonged interrogations, leaving passengers, including little children, without food or water or medical services for a very long time. Notably, Dejan Jankovic, the Serb deputy director of the Kosovo police, was detained alongside other police officers highlighting Serbia's ongoing efforts to intimidate and undermine the Kosovo Serbs. What's very clear is Serbia's consistent efforts to disrupt the integration process of Serbs in Kosovo, using both criminal and terrorist tactics to exert control and spread fear, thereby undermining the security and constitutional order of the Republic of Kosovo. The Serbs who had integrated into the institutions of Kosovo were coerced into massively resigning due to pressure exerted by Serbia's illegal structures. Attacks on their properties, destruction and risk to their lives with the goal of forcing them to leave Kosovo institutions are frequent scenarios invoked upon those who refuse to resign from Kosovo institutions. So yes, Kosovo Serbs are under pressure but not by the government of Kosovo, but clearly by the government of Serbia. Just imagine a Serb politician who laid flowers in the grave of a seven-year-old Kosovo girl killed during the war was immediately arrested and tortured in Serbia's prisons. And this is the fate of every Serb who does not strictly keep with this man's line. As you might remember, Kosovo Serbs were forced by Serbia to boycott local elections last year. Just yesterday, we once again offered citizens in our northern municipalities the chance to recall their current mayors and elect new ones. Unfortunately, this opportunity was vastly underutilized, primarily due to coercive pressures from Belgrade, orchestrated by the Serbian list and illegal criminal structures. Despite these challenges, Kosovo upheld its democratic values, demonstrating political maturity and strict adherence to the highest international standards. So if there are Albanian mayors still in their offices, the Serbs in Kosovo have Vucic to thank for. A recurring narrative propagated by Serbia is the discussion around the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities, ASMM, was initially signed as part of the 2013 agreement. I repeat, agreement. But it was never meant to become an isolated issue. 
several conditions had to be met by Serbia before the ASMM comes to life, notably the obligation to dissolve illegal structures. Yet so far, Serbia hasn't delivered in any of those, but has turned those illegal structures into paramilitary ones that commit destabilization and aggression against all of its neighbors. While we know too well that non-implementation of agreements is Serbia's middle name, it is quite a hypocrisy for Serbia to preach of the necessity for our side to deliver while they constantly violate their side of the deal, or deals, because there are too many of them not implemented by them. Whereas when it comes to the Brussels Agreement of 2023, it does have 11 articles, not just one. However, before proceeding any further, Vucic should clarify whether he accepts the 2023 agreement as his government clearly indicated in a letter sent to the EU that they do not. Whereas on behalf of the Republic of Kosovo, I'm here to recommit to all of you, as we have many times before, Kosovo's intention to implement this agreement swiftly, entirely, and unconditionally. Let me be frank, a Vucic that really cares about the Serb citizens in Kosovo is not a Vucic that openly opposes Kosovo's membership in the Council of Europe, a human rights organization. If his truest intention is to advance the rights of Kosovo Serbs, which he claims as the underlying motive for the implementation of the ASMM, then Vucic should be the strongest advocate for Kosovo's membership in the Council of Europe, which evidently means more human rights for Serbs in Kosovo, not less. More human rights for all the citizens of Kosovo, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their religion or other background. Esteemed members of the Council, the memories of the war still echo starkly in the minds and the hearts of so many of us seated in this room. When searching for the right words to convey to the world the true meaning of war, I turn to Vasfia Krasnici, Shurete Tahiri Suleimani, Elhame Mucholi, and Faria Hoti, who are sitting with me here today. The four members of my delegation as well as to the women, men, elderly, and children tuning in from their homes or on the move. We have not just heard of wars. We've lived through the horrors of it. We have not just read about wars in history books. Our recent history was defined by one. We don't just look at images of a war because the memories of war unfold with every passing day. The war is over, but the scars are left forever. I want to share with you just a few of more than a million stories that the people of Kosovo had to endure. Five days ago, we marked the 25th anniversary of one of the cruelest, most inhumane massacres of the Milosevic regime. Elhame Mucholi, who is accompanying me today, was only 14 years old when her house was raided by Serbia's police forces. 53 civilians, the vast majority of them children, were initially fired at as they were all gathered in one room. While the police left to resupply, Elhame managed to jump out of the window and run away, despite being wounded by bullets. Shortly after, the police returned stocked with patrol supplies to set all of the 53 civilians ablaze. Ilhami will never be able to forget the deafening screaming of some of the children that were still alive as they were being burned down to ashes. And as if that was not enough, the police set them on fire again and again and again. Little children, as young as six months old and ten months old, were burned down in an effort to wipe them off from the face of the earth, just because they were Albanian, just because they belonged to an ethnicity different from that of the policemen and the army of the country in the regime of which this man served as propaganda minister. The scale of the burning of the bodies of those little kids was so grave that the surviving family members 
We're only left with so little of the dearest ones as to be able to put all of the 53 victims in one single grave. A memorial was built in remembrance of the victims nearby the place where it all happened, but no Serb politician in these 25 years, not a single one, ever came to kneel in front of the grave of those little children. And to only think that massacres of this scale took place in almost every corner of our country, with little kids, women, including pregnant ones, mercilessly killed because of the warmongering mindset that is still alive and kicking in Belgrade. So ladies and gentlemen, one can listen to Vucic's propaganda and let him push his history revisionism based on Russia's playbook, but the only truth about his regime is one in which it is in constant denial and never accepting responsibility for these heinous crimes, never apologizing or even showing a sign of repent. Never. The massacre of Poklek, like all massacres around Kosovo, showed that Milosevic and his then propaganda minister today sitting in the chair of a president were not only seeking to wipe all Kosovo Albanians off the face of the earth, they also wanted to destroy evidence altogether and have no witness left. Yet, they failed over and over again. El Hame survived to relentlessly tell the world the story of her family and her nation, never bitter, never asking for revenge. Despite losing her mother, three sisters, two brothers, and many cousins in this massacre, she has turned into a genuine embodiment of resilience and strength and an unwavering champion for peace, reconciliation, but most importantly, defending truth and fighting for justice, justice for which they are still waiting for. While she sits with me here today seeking nothing but justice, Vucic sitting over there still offers shelter, protection and promotion to the police special units and the army brigade that committed the crimes against El Hame's family. And I'm here to offer you not propaganda, but actually ICTY cases confirming this. In the ICTY case of Shainovic et al., it was confirmed that the 86th detachment of the Serb Special Police Unit was present in Poklek on the day of, a, of the crime with these kind of operations, alongside with the 15th Armored Brigade and the 37th Motorized Brigade of the Yugoslav Army. Those in charge were identified, including the former commander of the 86th Detachment. An organization in Serbia, in Serbia, the Humanitarian Law Center gathered the evidence and pressed charges in front of the prosecutor's office in Serbia many, many years ago for those who were identified for killing these little kids. Yet, as of today, nothing, nothing has been undertaken by Serbia. Quite the opposite. The police officers leading this massacre were promoted to higher ranking positions and continue to receive honors. Today, I am also joined by Vasfia Krasnici Goodman. She was only 16 years old when she was raped, not once, but twice by Milosevic's police forces. They wanted to destroy her and to kill her hope. That is why they so mercilessly chose one of the cruelest tools of war, rape. You will suffer more if we let you live, they told her, as she was begging them to kill her. In spite of living through horror, Vasfia has thrived to fervently embark on her mission of raising awareness globally about the brutal crime of sexual violence in war and to becoming my special envoy on wartime sexual violence. Today, she's working closely with partners in Ukraine, in the Middle East, in countries in the African continent and elsewhere, sharing her expertise on most fitting approaches to support survivors of sexual violence during the war. She's committed herself to being there for survivors globally and has turned into their voice until the time is ripe for them to speak out themselves. In this noble mission, she is joined by our very own Shurete. Shurete Tahiri Sulimani, who's also part of my delegation today. 
is also one of the thousands of survivors of sexual violence from the last war in Kosovo. In 1999, she too was a target of this most inhumane war crime. She was raped in front of her little daughters, aged three years old and one year old, respectively. Milosevic's forces committed these atrocious acts in front of little kids, wanting to make sure that the hurting and the pain spans across generations. They wanted to kill, it, to kill the spirit of a people that always, always stood up for peace, liberty and democracy. Yet, they failed. While Vasfia Shureta and her daughter still grapple with the trauma of the war, they are unwavering in their commitment to leave no stone unturned to make sure that others never have to experience what they have gone through and that justice is served. They have chosen action over despair. They have chosen to speak up, to advocate against stigma, rallying a whole country around their cause and working tirelessly, not just pursuing justice, but also amplifying their voice and the voices of wartime sexual violence survivors in Kosovo and everywhere else in the world. Every day we witness the extraordinary resilience and determination of Kosovo women who refuse to be silenced by the horrors they endured. Their fight against stigma and their quest for justice are exemplary. I will keep repeating over and over again, holding perpetrators accountable for these heinous acts is our moral responsibility. Yet, the number of cases where Serbia had put perpetrators of wartime rape behind bars is zero, zero. Because of this despicable war, in almost every corner of my country, you will still face the many shadows of, of the aftermath of the war. I am also humbled to be joined today by Fahriye Hoti. In Krusha, the village where Fahriye lives to this day, together with her children, almost all the men were killed mercilessly and all the children grew up without their fathers. Some still remaining forcibly disappeared, including Fahriya's husband. Overall, more than 1,600 persons from all around Kosovo are still forcibly disappeared in massive graves in Serbia. Despite agreeing to open the archives through an agreement reached in Brussels, Vucic constantly rejects to implement it. The forcible disappearance of our citizens, many of whom were children, represents one of the most monstrous crimes of the Milosevic genocidal regime. Therefore, once again, we demand their return and continue to work with resolve to pursue justice. This pursuit is not simply about finding answers. It's about affirming our commitment to human dignity and to ensuring that such atrocities are never repeated. Despite facing unimaginable loss, Fahriya never surrendered. She transformed her grief into action while turning her pain into unwavering determination. Today, she leads Cooperativa Krusha, a business that not only revived her village's economy, but became a powerhouse for its renowned products across Europe and the United States. Most importantly, she became a symbol of hope and empowerment for women in her Krusha, in all of Kosovo and across the world. What Milosevic and his propaganda minister Vucic wanted was a people that was scarred and broken. What they got is a people who are resilient, compassionate, and unwavering in their ambition to make never again a reality and not just a slogan while putting the pursuit for justice center stage. What they got is a people that never seeks revenge, but will never give up on justice. Ladies and gentlemen, 25 years ago, nations around the world faced a critical decision to choose between supporting a genocidal regime or stand with the victims of that regime. The people of Kosovo will forever remain grateful that you chose humanity over repression. You chose the right side of history 
committed to act before it was too late. It was, unfortunately, already too late in Srebrenica, where over 8,000 men and boys were ruthlessly killed with the sole intention of exterminating them, a genocide in the heart of Europe. We may not be a member of the United Nations yet, but we wholeheartedly support the resolution on Srebrenica genocide, defending the truth, fighting history revisionism, and rejecting genocide denial is the only way towards long-lasting peace and reconciliation. While it unfortunately took the world 29 years to agree on a Srebrenica Genocide Commemoration Day, and many of the mothers of Srebrenica have not lived to watch you while you vote on May 2nd, it is the hope of the women standing with me today and the hope of the people of Kosovo who went through the horrors of the Milosevic regime that we will live through the day when you will all agree to fight for justice for all of the victims of Kosovo. I assure you all that in the free, independent, sovereign and democratic Republic of Kosovo, a republic that is there to stay forever and among its people, you will always find a partner and an ally who does not take freedom and peace for granted. Our story is far from over and much of our potential is yet to be fulfilled but our future is bright. I am confident that one day we will join you at this table, becoming part of the family of nations that currently makes up the United Nations. And as we make great strides forward, I want to reassure you that no attempt by Serbia to deny war crimes or revise history will ever succeed as long as we have a voice. Thank you. The right of reply will come at the end, as we had agreed. Oh, my goodness. I pass the floor to President Vucic. Please keep it short. It's not about replying to everything that was said. It's about something that happened for the first time in his body. You brought people that, don't, that do not belong here to diplomatic corps or to advisory team of Madame Osmani. It is a sort of political theater and a setup for Serbian delegation. And what we were listening to, I was fully focused on a report made by Karolina Ziade. And what, we are li what, we, what we've been listening so far, it was like a war trial process against Serbs from, for something that happened 25 years ago. Not a single word about the report. Nothing about last six months. Why didn't you inform us who was going to be a member of each delegation? Do you really believe that there are or that there were no raped Serbian women in Kosovo during that period. I can show you, but there is one person that I couldn't bring here as a part of my delegation. That's Marica Miric from Bielopolje, from Kosovo. That woman at that period of time was raped several times and then slaughtered. But that was not a topic of our today's meeting. That's the real issue. Please, next time, inform us, at least, as a founder of the United Nations, that some citizens that will be present at this session will bring more people to put the blame on the other side, because we are here to discuss the report and the possible consequences of political activities and everything else. And just to ask you one question, because you heard that a few days ago Serbia presented Irani drones somewhere in Serbia. Just for all of you to hear the truth, to hear what is re really going on. I have never seen, and no one in Serbia has ever seen any single Irani drone. 
It has never happened in this our country. This can be addressed in your right of reply. Thank, Thank you. you, President Vucic. And Thank with you. regards to the, the delegation from Kosovo, we have nothing to do with it. This is UN protocol that does accreditation. Just as we do not know the names of your um, delegation who is accredited here. I now pass the floor to Ms. Osmani, and please we must keep, uh, maintain the respect of this council and keep brief. On the point of order, I pass the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I planned uh, from uh, the outset to, 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 to speak about this during my statement, but I think that raising this question under a uh, point of order would be more appropriate. Uh, the President Vucic warned me, but I wanted to say the same. Sorry, rather, President Vucic said this before, but I wanted to say, Madam Asmani uh, constantly uh, t uh, turns to people sitting behind her and flatters them uh, with the label of members of their delegation. Madam, uh, 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 Madam Osmani was invited under th Rule 37 as a briefer as a, uh, in today's meeting, and her participation does not provide for the presence of any delegation alongside her and those people who are behind her in the best of cases. Is if, if even if protocol allowed them in, should be seated over there in the chamber over there. This is a clear of a breach of uh, rules of procedure, and regardless of who carried this out, Madam President, we ask that this be gotten that, that, that this be addressed duly. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation, and I am informed that members of civil society do bring under th Rule 39 and 37. Um, members of delegation with them, and this is how they were accredited. Thank you. I now pass the floor to Mr. Spani. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Of course, I reserve my right to respond to all of the spear of propaganda that we heard from Vucic earlier, but when it comes to the procedural issue that has been raised, I want to uh, inform the members of this council that apart from being Great advocates for justice, the four women sitting behind me, are also members of my cabinet, appointed as such. So they are also here on an advisory capacity because they work for causes that are very dear to my heart, such as supporting women that are survivors of sexual violence, as well as supporting the families of those who suffered from the war. So they are in that capacity as well, as members of my cabinet. to the distinguished representative from the rest. Madam President, Madam Osmani can believe that she has a cabinet, ministers, advisors, and anything else. Uh, but uh, uh, Madam uh, Osmani, in our view, has no cabinet. And even if she, she believes that there is a cabinet, uh, then she has been invited to join us under rule, uh, th uh, as a private person under the Rule 37. Once again, I draw attention to that as a private person. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. And thank you, Special Re uh, Representative Ziada, for your briefing. We also welcome President Vucic and President Osmani uh, to today's briefing. Madam President, the United States shares the aspiration of all countries in the Western Balkans, including Kosovo and Serbia, to build greater regional economic integration foster regional stability, democracy, and multi-ethnic societies, and to enshrine the rule of law. We will continue to work closely with our partners in the region, European partners through the EU-facilitated dialogue, NATO, OSCE, and others. When we look at the history of the region in recent years, we see enormous progress. But we also continue to see, far too often, uncoordinated or escalatory actions on the part of both Serbia and Kosovo that delays progress. It has now been seven months since the Serb paramilitary attack on the Kosovo police near Banska Monastery in northern Kosovo. Serbia has made no meaningful progress in holding accountable those involved, including the self-proclaimed leader of the attack, Milan Radojic. We urge full accountability in accordance with the rule of law. It is critical that Serbia work with KFOR to prevent another attack like the one on September 24 from happening again. 
We were also deeply concerned by the interruption of freedom of movement for Kosovan citizens transiting Serbia on April 17, along with the detention of Kosovan citizens, including ethnic Serbs serving in the Kosovo police. This action was a violation of past agreements on freedom of movement and a form of intimidation of Kosovan Serbs participating in Kosovo civic life. We also remain concerned over recent uncoordinated actions taken by the government of Kosovo, including its enforcement of the Central Bank of Kosovo's amended regulation on cash operations, which are inconsistent with Kosovo's commitment to work through the EU-facilitated dialogue. These actions affect the welfare of vulnerable and non-majority communities and undermine the path to normalization between Kosovo and Serbia. We urge both parties to take concrete steps forward through the EU-facilitated dialogue on all their commitments, including finding a solution to the currency issue and progress towards the establishment of the Association of Serb-Majority Municipalities. The dialogue is the agreed and only path for normalization between Serbia and Kosovo and progress towards membership in European institutions. Madam President, consistent with its legal requirements, Kosovo held a mayoral recall vote yesterday in the four municipalities in the north of Kosovo. We understand from the Central Election Commission that there was extremely low voter turnout. We regret that certain political actors did not make full use of the democratic tools available to them under Kosovan law to advance effective and representative democracy. We appreciate the efforts made by Kosovan election officials to allow all Kosovan citizens registered in the four municipalities to participate in this democratic process. We note there is no decision by the voters to recall the elected mayors and that they remain in place under Kosovo's legal framework. Madam President, we note once again that UNMIC has long outlived its original mandate and repeat our call for the Council to review its operations and sunset the mission. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States and pass the floor to the representative of Guyana. Thank you, Madam President. And I thank SRSG Caroline Ziade for her briefing and welcome the presence of their, Excellency, their excellencies the President of Serbia and Kosovo at today's meeting. Guyana acknowledges and supports the important work of the United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo, UNMIC, in the promotion of peace, security, stability, and respect for human rights in Kosovo. We believe that the mission's objectives to promote inter-community trust building, to support human rights and the rule of law, and to support progress towards the normalization of relations between Belgrade and Pristina remain critically important. We also acknowledge the critical assistance provided by the wider UN system to UNMIC in the execution of its mandate. The collaboration of a wide spectrum of UN agencies, including UNODC, UNDP, UNOPS, UN Women, and IOM, among others, with Kosovo's government and civil society, are essential to building a stable state and in contributing to securing a lasting peace. We express our concern regarding the instances of interference with the premises and assets of UNMIC, including vandalism of the mission's offices. We call on the relevant authorities of Kosovo to ensure the protect protection of UNMIC's premises and assets, and to further ensure that the mission has full access to its premises in northern Kosovo. Madam President, Guyana applauds the leadership of the European Union in facilitating dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo and believes that this mechanism remains the most vital avenue for ensuring that a just and sustainable solution to this conflict is achieved. The significant progress made through the dialogue in 2023 was encouraging. However, we are deeply concerned by recent actions that have contributed to an escalation in tension and by the absence of effort by the parties toward the implementation of the agreed provisions of the February 2023 agreement. We encourage a re-examination of any actions that have the potential to disrupt the economic and social well-being of minority communities. It is essential that the human rights of all are upheld. 
We commend the actions taken by the government of Kosovo to implement policies that advance gender equality and women's empowerment. We also urge continued efforts to address concerns related to gender-based violence. Madam President, Guyana continues to support an independent, democratic Kosovo that can fully participate in the international multilateral system. We call on all parties to recommit to the EU-led Belgrade-Pristina dialogue and to safeguard the hard-won gains through the full implementation of existing agreements. We firmly believe that through dialogue and diplomacy, the people of Serbia and Kosovo will be able to live side by side in peace and prosperity. I thank you. I thank the representative of Guyana for the statement, and I give the floor to the representative of China. President, I welcome the presence of His Excellency Mr. Vucic, President of Serbia, at today's meeting. I listened attentively to the briefing provided by Special Representative Ziad. The escalating tensions in northern Kosovo over the recent period and frequent violence and security incidents on the ground are truly worrying. The Kosovo Authority's announcement to abolish the Serbian dinar and violent searches targeting ethnic Serbs seriously disrupted the normal livelihoods of the Serb community and gave rise to panic and tensions. China expresses its serious concern over those developments. We urge Pristina to revoke unreasonable decisions and seize unilateral actions that exacerbate tensions and confrontation. The establishment of an association of Serb majority municipalities is an important part of the 2013 Brussels Agreement. The Kosovar authorities have made explicit commitments in this regard and should honor them in good faith. We hope that the EU will uphold neutrality, impartiality, and justice in its mediation. China's position on the Kosovo issue has been consistent and clear. We support the parties to engage each other within the framework of Security Council Resolution 1244 and reach a mutually acceptable solution through dialogue and consultation. During this process, Serbia's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity should be fully respected. The Security Council should continue to be seized of the Kosovo issue. We support the continued work of the United Nations, United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo. Pristina should respect and ensure the safety of AMIC personnel and premises and facilitate the smooth performance of AMIC's mandate. President, last month Russia requested an open meeting on the 25th anniversary of NATO's bombing against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. During that meeting, some council members expressed their wish to have further discussions on that matter under the topic of Kosovo. Twenty-five years have passed since NATO's war against Yugoslavia, but that war is far from becoming history. The situation in Kosovo remains tense as we speak. The countries and peoples in the Balkans still carry unhealed wounds. Europe is still affected by war and deeply mired in security wars. Wars have been waged in the name of human rights and humanitarianism against sovereign countries. The UN Charter and international law have been repeatedly violated. The warnings and lessons from that war 25 years ago remain sobering. First, disputes between countries should be resolved through peaceful means such as negotiation and consultation. The reflex use or threat of force should be opposed at all times. If we allow the biggest fist to have the final say, the sovereignty and independence of small and less powerful countries will be undermined. Justice will cease to exist and the pursuit of peace will be eternally elusive. Second, the principle of respect for state sovereignty and territorial integrity should be applied universally rather than selectively on the basis of expediency. After waging a war against Yugoslavia, NATO repeatedly invoked the protection of human rights and subsequently carried out military operations in Libya and other places. Facts have shown 
that the so-called narrative of human rights above sovereignty is effectively reducing human rights to a political tool to interfere in the internal affairs of states. Ultimately, such a practice not only eroded sovereignty but also failed to deliver the promised protection of human rights. Third. In the pursuit of national security, states should uphold the concept of indivisible security and seek common security, rather than achieving their own security at the expense of that of others. Embracing and implementing a common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security concept represents a long-term approach to tackling global security challenges. Fourth. Ethnic and communal issues in a country should be properly resolved by the government and people of that country through their own efforts within legal framework, and should not be used as an excuse for external interference. Most countries in the world are multi-ethnic. Any communal tensions and fault lines should be resolved organically through intercommunal dialogue, exchange, interaction, and integration. The coexistence of multiple communities in Kosovo is shaped by history. Achieving tolerance, reconciliation, and harmonious coexistence among all ethnic groups in Kosovo serves the long-term and fundamental interests of all parties. We hope that all parties can draw lessons from history, reflect on themselves. Contribute more to the maintenance of peace and security, and prevent a relapse into conflict in Kosovo and the wider Balkans. China remains committed to working with all parties to make sustained efforts to promote the peaceful coexistence of the two communities and the political settlement of relevant issues in Kosovo. Thank you, President. Thank the representative of China for their statements, and I give the floor to the representative of Ecuador. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. We are grateful to Special Representative Ziade for her detailed briefing. We welcome the presence among us of the President of the Republic of Serbia, His Excellency Mr. Vucic, and we also recognize the presence of Ms. Osmani. Ecuador reiterates the importance of a constructive and good faith dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade. The EU facilitated dialogue provides a forum for addressing delicate political issues affecting the communities. Ecuador encourages all parties to commit constructively to this process and to the full and effective implementation of agreements reached to date. The recent Secretary General's report shows the fragile nature of the security situation in the North. We reiterate our condemnation of any act of violence which would endanger peace and security in the region, and we encourage all parties to show utmost responsibility and to avoid actions or rhetoric which might reverse progress achieved so far. Human rights and the rule of law must be respected, ensuring the protection of all communities. Ecuador calls for account to be taken of the legitimate concerns expressed regarding regulations on cash transactions and their impact on the economic and social rights of the non-majority communities. Similarly, the right to freedom of expression and freedom of the media must be guaranteed, avoiding any action which may undermine these fundamental rights. We further reiterate the importance of Resolution 1244 into ELIA within the framework of respect for UN property. All UN facilities must be fully respected. We echo the Secretary General's appeal to the competent authorities to provide support to UNMIC to recover full access and unfettered access to their premises in the north of Kosovo. Moreover, we welcome the holding of the first meeting of the Working Group on Missing Persons since 2021 which took place on the 31st of January. We hope that both parties will remain committed to making progress on this crucial issue in line with the Declaration on Missing Persons. Madam President, Ecuador welcomes the efforts of UNMIC to prioritize trust building between the communities and an improvement in social cohesion. We recognize the role of the mission and the various international partners in efforts to reduce tensions and promote peace. 
I would be remiss if I did not make particular, uh, say a particular word of praise for the Special Representative Ziade. Her role exemplifies the importance of uh, gender-based leadership in resolving conflicts and building peace. This encourages us to promote the inclusion of women at all levels of the peace process, ensuring that their views and their experiences will enrich and guide our actions towards finding more just and sustainable solutions. Ecuador remains committed to this support to the initiatives that will promote peace, security, and sustainable development in the region. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ecuador for their statements. I give the floor to the representative of France. Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to thank the Special Representative of the Secretary General for her briefing, and I welcome among us the presence of the President of Serbia and President of Kosovo. Progress towards normalization in relations between Serbia and Kosovo is urgently needed. This will ensure stability in the region and is an unavoidable condition for European rapprochement, which both countries have chosen. That is the purpose of the brussels ORED agreement, which was concluded just over a year ago, the most ambitious agreement to date between the two countries. This is a major success, and we should collectively ensure its full implementation. France will continue to support European mediation to obtain a comprehensive, definitive, comprehensive and legally binding agreement. And we are committed to the uh, ensuring that their commitments are upheld. Each party must play its role. France welcomes actions taken on both sides. Constructive commitment by Serbian authorities in this dialogue facilitated by the EU last, at the end of last year allowed for notable progress on mutual recognition of license plates and on the issue of energy. The implementation by Kosovo and the, uh, the Dekani constitutional court decision are also positive developments. These recent advances are encouraging, but we must go further. The establishment of the Serb Majority Municipalities Association has been expected from the Kosovo authorities for far too long now. The absence of progress on this point remains an obstacle to the effective implementation of the rights of people belonging to the Serb minority and therefore to the pros European prospects for the country. We hope that irreversible progress will be achieved in line with the aspirations of Kosovo to accede to the Council of Europe, while proper treatment of minorities is at the heart of the mandate of this organization. Moreover, elections must be organized quickly in the north of Kosovo with the active participation of all communities in order to elect new mayors. On this point, France recalls that the recall of elected mayors with only 3% of votes um, would be the quickest option for restoring representative democracy in the four municipalities in the north and will be a gesture towards de-escalation. France, moreover, calls on the two parties quickly to find a solution in the EU-led discussions to go beyond tensions created by the decision of Kosovo authorities on the financial, the cash transfers. It is essential for those responsible for the Banska attack in September to be held accountable. France will continue to follow this question closely. France supports uh, the efforts of UNMIG to restore the rule of law, respect for human rights, and ensure reconciliation between the communities in Kosovo in coordination with K4 and ULEX Kosovo. Its mandate is in intrinsically linked to normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo, and France would welcome an extension of this as long as is necessary. Finally, France calls on the Serb and Kosovar leaders to show their responsibility and to uphold their courageous decisions. Uh, their commitment to take courage decisions. The parties must abstain from any un unilateral action which could increase tension. The fait accompli policy is not an acceptable modus operandi. It is only through dialogue and European mediation that the problems which arise can be resolved. Let us recall that the EU was entrusted with this mandate by the UN General Assembly. France reaffirms its support of the uh, 
prospect for European integration for Serbia and Kosovo. No, no one can ignore the sovereign will of these two countries for the European choice. There is no alternative either for Serbia or for Kosovo than to arrive at an agreement which will resolve once and for all the dispute between the two countries. Thank you. Thank you, France, for the statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of Switzerland. Madam President, I wish to thank the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of the United Nations Mission in Kosovo for his statement. I welcome uh, the Excellencies President Vucic and President Osmani, and I take this opportunity to underline the strong human ties that unite Switzerland with their respective countries. The normalization of relations on the basis of strengthened trust is in the interest and to the benefit of the peoples of both Kosovo and Serbia. I wish to take this opportunity to give three examples of approaches that we wish to see strengthened. Number one, measured rhetoric and responsible commitment on the part of political leaders in order to look forward, look forward to a future in which past grievances are acknowledged without impeding progress. It is necessary for the political leaders of Kosovo and Serbia to lay the foundations for cooperation and common understanding in order to set an example for their populations as well. Second, a clear and increased commitment to the EU facilitated dialogue. The progress achieved on the energy roadmap and license plates shows the concrete results of this format. Outstanding issues, including the consequences of implementing monetary regulations in Kosovo, need to be resolved through this dialogue, taking into account the interests of the communities concerned. In addition, it is necessary to strengthen the legitimacy and the sustainability of solutions in the peace process, including through the increased participation of women in negotiations. Thirdly, concrete progress. More than a year after the promising elections, uh, de promising decisions taken under the Brussels and ORID agreements, it is high time to move from commitments on paper to deeds. We call on Serbia to remove any ambiguity about its commitment to the agreements and to refrain from opposing Kosovo's membership in international organizations. And we call on Kosovo to establish without delay the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities, a commitment it made in 2013. Switzerland is committed to building constructive relations between the parties through practical and discreet measures. For example, since 2015, we have been facilitating meetings to enable direct contact between the representatives of political parties in Kosovo and Serbia. Madam President, both parties share responsibility for reducing tensions. Escalations like the one that occurred in Bainska last autumn need to be avoided at all costs, and the perpetrators need to be brought to justice. We reiterate our appreciation and continued support for KFOR's important work in ensuring a peaceful and secure environment. Turning to yesterday's votes on the dismissal of mayors in no nor northern Kosovo, Switzerland regrets that the Serb community did not participate. We encourage the government of Kosovo to step up its efforts to integrate the Serb minority into society. This brings us back to trust building, both between communities and between parties, as a prerequisite for preserving peace and moving towards peaceful, prosperous, multi-ethnic societies. I wish to add a final approach to this subject with an example drawn from the report. For the first time since 2021, the Working Group on Missing Persons, chaired by the ICRC, resumed its meetings in Geneva at the beginning of this year, recognizing that dealing with the past is essential to promote reconciliation. We encourage continued cooperation in this and other areas, including those related to sexual violence committed during the conflict. We thank Anmik for its report, and we remain ready to discuss constructively a possible strategic review of the mission. To conclude, I wish to emphasize an observation made by the Secretary General in the new Agenda for Peace. Diplomatic cooperation, while important among like-minded countries, 
is absolutely crucial between disagreeing countries. Thank you. To the representative of Switzerland, and I now give the floor to the representative of Algeria. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. <coughs> I will I welcome the presence at today's meeting of His Excellency Mr. Alexander Vucic, President of the Republic of Serbia. I thank SRSG Caroline Ziade for her briefing. I listened to the remarks made by Ms. Osmani Sadriou. Madam President, Algeria would like to express its satisfaction on the progress made at the end of 2023 in terms of implementation of the 2022 Energy Roadmap, the Customs Agreement, and the reciprocal freedom of movement for vehicles between Serbia and Kosovo. Meanwhile, the situation in Kosovo has been unfortunately affected by some incidents and unilateral decisions that disturbed the already tense situation, especially in the north of Kosovo. The security incident on 24 September in Banska that led to the tragic loss of life and the unilateral decision about the new currency regulation on cash transactions are source of deep concern. This concern lays mainly on the fact that such unfortunate developments contribute to raise inter-ethnic tensions and impact the safety and security, as well as the economic and social rights, especially of non-majority communities and the most vulnerable people. Against this backdrop, Algeria would like to stress the following. First, it is important to refrain from any action that could lead to escalation and ethnic tensions in Kosovo. Such actions could only undermine the fragile stability in Kosovo and might seriously hinder efforts toward normalization and maintaining peace and security in the region. Second, it is vital to ensure effective representation of Serbs in the local institutions. In this regard, it is of utmost importance to promptly, to promptly hold early local, local elections in the four northern municipalities of Kosovo with the participation of the Serb community. Also, we call on the authorities in Kosovo to undertake the necessary steps and measures to establish the association community of Serb municipalities as agreed upon in the 2013 Brussels Agreement. Third, we commend the efforts of the Special Representative of the Secretary General, Ms. Caroline Ziade, and reiterate the vital, role, the vital role of ANMIC in stabilizing the situation on the ground. The work achieved by the mission, especially in terms of trust building efforts aiming at bridging div divides, especially in terms of trust, trust building efforts aiming at bridging divides across, across communities is commendable. Fourth, Algeria believes that constructive and genuine dialogue remains the only viable path. We appreciate in this regard the AU facilitated dialogue aiming at advancing the political process towards a peaceful settlement of this conflict. Finally, Algeria supports all efforts to reach mutually acceptable solution to the issue within the framework of UNSC Resolution 1244 and with full respect of the principles enshrined in the UN Charter. I thank you. I thank the representative of Algeria and I give the floor to the representative of the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Madam President. I also thank SRSG Ziade for uh, her briefing. My delegation also welcomes His Excellency Mr. Vucici, President of Serbia, and Her Excellency Ms. Usmani Sadriu, President of Kosovo, to the Council. Madam President, the Republic of Korea hopes for reconciliation, peace, and prosperity in, in the Western Balkans region, which has experienced a turbulent 
and heartbreaking history in modern times. Around one year ago, Serbia and Kosovo agreed to resume negotiations to normalize relations based on the EU's proposal. And the international community, including the Republic of Korea, warmly welcomed this progress. Indeed, we all hoped and expected that the last year's agreement would lead to a sustainable resolution of the long-standing confrontation and conflict in the region through the lessening of tensions and the advancement of critical dialogue. However, it is regrettable that discussions to implement the 2023 agreement have not yet made substantive progress. Rather, tensions between Belgrade and Pristina have increased, and the security situation in northern Kosovo has remained tenuous. For instance, the attack against Kosovo police, which took place in Banyaska village on 24 September 2023, posed a severe threat to the safety of Kosovo, Kosovo citizens and exacerbated an already deteriorating security environment in northern Kosovo. There must be full accountability for all perpetrators of the attack. In addition, the new regulation of the Kosovo Central Bank on currency transactions constitute a cause for concern in terms of impact. Even if we acknowledge that the regulation is intended to enhance financial stability and transparency in Kosovo, it is expected to have a direct and negative impact on the ability of Serbian residents in Kosovo to lead their daily lives. My delegation believes that the issues should be faithfully discussed further within the framework of the EU-facilitated dialogue in order to reduce negative impacts on vulnerable people. Madam President, the Republic of Korea firmly supports a peaceful resolution of issues related to Kosovo and Serbia through political dialogue and negotiations. In this connection, we reiterate our support for the EU's efforts and its role in, in the mediation. And we also stress the importance of the work of ULEX in consolidating the rule of law in Kosovan institutions. At the same time, we call on the two sides, Kosovo and Serbia, to refrain from provo provocative statements and unilateral actions, which can lead to unnecessary conflict. Take sincere and concrete steps to reduce tension and build trust between both parties and actively participate in EU led negotiations once again with a view to normalize relations and establish lasting peace in the region. Last but not least, my delegation commends the entire staff of UNMIC and other key international partners, including K4, for their tireless efforts to ensure peace and stability in Kosovo, as well as the wider region. I'd like to conclude my remarks by adding that there is a need to review modifying uh, UNMIC's mandate, considering that K4 and ULEX are currently carrying out some of the missions of UNMIC, which was established in 1999. I thank you. I thank the representative of the of Republic of Korea, and I give the floor to the representative of Sierra Leone. Thank you, Madam President. I thank you for convening this meeting. Let me also thank Ms. Caroline Ziade, the Special Representative and Head of the United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo, ONMIC, for a comprehensive briefing. I acknowledge the presence of His Excellency Mr. Alexander Vucic, President of Serbia, and Ms. Vjusa Uzmani Sadiu, and welcome their participation in today's meeting. Sierra Leone commends ONMIC for its continued commitment towards the maintenance of international peace and security in Kosovo, the establishment and strengthening of its governance institutions, its efforts in promoting the rule of law, respect for human rights by all relevant authorities, as well as advancing Kosovo's reconstruction and infrastructural development. We also use this opportunity to express our appreciation for the coordinated humanitarian interventions by UNHCR, IOM, OSC, and other international partners who have contributed towards the safe and dignified return 
and reintegration of Kosovo's multi-ethnic people. We urge continued support toward programs that enhance cohesion, specifically by addressing the concerns of women and youth, their full, equal, meaningful, and safe participation and representation being essential tenets for building sustainable peace and stability. We commend the progress achieved by Belgrade and Pristina on the implementation of the 2022 Energy Roadmap, the registration of vehicle license plates, and reciprocal freedom of movement for vehicles between Kosovo and Serbia. Such concrete efforts are key to de-escalating tensions, opening dialogue, and mapping the path towards lasting peace. Madam President, having commended the progress being made towards lasting peace, let me proceed to further highlight three points on preventing a re-escalation of conflict, consolidation of peace, and building for progress. First, Sierra Leone notes with concern reports of the attack on Bianska village in northern Kosovo in September last year, the incidents of violence that followed, and the surrounding rhetoric. Whilst we acknowledge the swift intervention of international forces, we urge the authorities in Pristina and Belgrade at all levels to remain mindful of their unparalleled role in preventing an upsurge of conflict. We further welcome the accountability mechanisms within Kosovo and cooperation with international regional security apparatus to hold responsible any actor that threatens the peace and security. We emphasize the role of the European Union Special Representative for the Belgrade-Pristina Dialogue and other Western Balkan regional issues and commend their relentless efforts towards fostering trust between Kosovo and Serbia. We believe these efforts are critical to preventing the erosion of progress achieved by the parties. Second, we welcome the operationalization of democratic self-governing institutions, which we view as the tenet to normalizing life for the people of Kosovo and for consolidating peace and harmony within the region. We also welcome the deference towards the Kosovo judicial system by the authorities, including the implementation of the 2016 Constitutional Court ruling regarding the property of Visoki Dikani Monastery and ongoing trials for war crimes. The Constitutional Court must stand as the bedrock of the law and sound governance, including providing clarity on critical matters such as the recent issue of the central bank regulation and the use of the dinar, which has implication for the lives and livelihoods of the people in the region. We urge the Kosovo privatization agency to reconsider its approach towards assuming control of properties while strongly condemning any attempt by non-state actors to deter access to, boggle, deface, and cause destruction to private properties, particularly those occupied by onmic and religious and cultural sites across Kosovo. Third and final point on building institutions for peace and stability. Sierra Leone wishes to emphasize that the exercise of economic rights, religious and cultural freedoms should be institutionalized with a view to engendering and preserving a multi-ethnic society. Underscoring the importance of building beyond the conflict, we note with regret the developments relating to the northern municipalities' mayoral elections in Kosovo. We reiterate our call for the authorities in Belgrade and Pristina to deepen cooperation, particularly with respect to finalizing the establishment of the Association Community of Serbian Majority Municipalities in Kosovo. 
We commend the work of ONMIC in projects focusing on inter-community, inter-ethnic, and inter-municipal cooperation, as well as on empowering women, youth, persons with disabilities, and children with special needs to actively engage in capacity-building activities. Such programs must be fully integrated into Kosovo's governance structure for sustainability. It is therefore a matter of necessity that member states continue to support the efforts of various UN entities operating in the region, including the Peace Building Fund, UNDP, UNFPA, UNESCO, and UN Women. Let me conclude, Madam President, by recalling that peace is not the absence of conflict. It requires more efforts. Sierra Leone continues to count on the good offices of the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of ONMIC, the European Union facilitated dialogue, and the resilience of the Quint to engage all stakeholders for the normalizations of relations between the parties. I thank you. I thank the representative of Sierra Leone, and I give the floor to the representative of Slovenia. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Madam President. <clears throat> Uh, we thank SRSG and Hand of UNMIC, uh, Ms. Caroline uh, Ziader, uh, for her briefing. We also want to extend our gratitude to the President of Serbia, Aleksandr Vucic, um, and the President of Kosovo, uh, Kosovo Vyosos Mani Sadriu, for their statements. Madam President, there is a lot of pain and too much unhealed wounds in Kosovo, in both communities, Albanian and Serb. Therefore, in order to understand the challenges that Kosovo and the region are facing today and assess the progress made, one needs to reflect on a starting point 25 years ago. Yes, 25 years have passed since the conflict in Kosovo ended with NATO intervention. The Alliance acted out of need to stop the killing of civilians, and it led to the adoption of the Resolution 2044 1244 by this Council. Next Sunday, Kosovo will remember 25 years of the most horrific mass killing during the conflict. In Meja, a village in Kosovo, around 300 men and boys were taken out of the refugee convoy and executed. Many more lives were shattered that day. I met grieving widows and mothers, and some are still waiting for the remains of their loved ones. I visited Krushamade, the village of war widows, and I recognize Ms. Hoti today in the audience. In the village, all males aged 13 and older, more than 100 of them, were killed. Last month, as President Vucic mentioned it, was 20 years since violent unrest against Serbs their property and religious sites happened across Kosovo. Four years after the conflict, in just few days, hundreds of Serb homes were demolished and tens of religious objects were set on fire. Serbs were fleeing Kosovo in fear for their lives. I met a Serb who escaped through the bathroom window and ran 40 kilometers to the safety of the north of Kosovo, watching Serb homes and churches in flames along the way. Yes, one can find a lot of pain in Kosovo, as probably in every conflict. However, focusing on the horrible past can prevent seeing better prospects for the future. And the future for all communities lies in the multi-ethnic and multicultural Kosovo, at peace with itself and Serbia. Since those dark days of the 90s, Kosovo has made huge steps forward. A once devastated and traumatized society is today on its European reforms path through the stabilization association process. It met rigorous criteria to be recently granted a visa-free travel to the countries of the European Union. And the future of the whole region is in the European Union, not because we, the EU, say so, but because this is what the citizens of the region want and expect. The European Union represents to them the area of peace, rule of law and respect of human rights, the area of free flow of people and ideas, the area of progress, 
the area of reconciliation. Citizens across the region want a normal life, and this is where they see it. Madam President, UNMIC was set up immediately after the end of the conflict and has been instrumental in supporting stability and security in Kosovo in its initial transition phase. UNMIC filled the institutional vacuum and started providing services to people. Through close collaboration with international partners, UNMIC facilitated the development of local governance, justice system, and police forces, laying a solid foundation for sustainable governance in Kosovo. Progress made has been immense, and the foundations for a peaceful coexistence have been established. The Kosovo Constitution guarantees all its citizens and communities, including the Serbs, equal treatment with seats in the parliament, in the government, and official language. However, challenges persist. As always, it is about implementation. Kosovo Albanians and Kosovo Serbs remain, to the large extent, divided communities. Madam President, against this backdrop, I would like to make the follow following points. Firstly, the EU facilitated dialogue is the only established forum for the normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo. We must support it in every possible way. We are concerned with the lack of progress and even backsliding on certain issues in the dialogue. However, there is no alternative to it. There is no path forward without the dialogue and normalization of relations. Slovenia urges both Belgrade and Pristina to prioritize the implementation of the agreements reached, and in particular of the Brussels Agreement and its annex from 2023. Secondly, normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo goes hand in hand with providing a safe, secure, and prosperous environment for Serbs in Kosovo. One depends on the other. Appropriate level of self-management self of the ethnic Serb community in Kosovo should be implemented in good faith and respecting needs, interests, and concerns of both sides. Solutions can't be imposed on either side. As they say, a man convinced against his will is against you still. But the need to make progress on fulfilling this part of the dialogue agreement is urgent. Government in Pristina needs to implement what has been agreed and extend a hand to Serbs in Kosovo. For trust to be built and for progress in dialogue to be made, Serbia and Kosovo need to address security concerns, including preventing armed smuggling and holding perpetrators of illegal activities accountable. We call for full cooperation to investigate the Banska incident of last September. Progress in the investigation and persecution is crucial for building towards normality. Thirdly, Slovenia welcomes upholding the Kosovo Constitutional Court's ruling granting disputed land surrounding Monastery Visoki Deceni to the Serb Orthodox Church. This was one of the 11 agreed points of the Ohrid 2023 agreement. The agreement also affirms that neither Kosovo nor Serbia can represent each other internationally and that Serbia would not oppose Kosovo's membership in international organizations. Finally, building trust is most effective when it starts with young people, and we appreciate the role Kosovo's youth plays in fostering a future of peaceful coexistence between communities. In this regard, I want to commend UNMIC's Trust Building Forum, established in my country's capital five years ago. Slovenia supports UNMIC's transition to tasks where it can have an added value in change circumstances, like encouraging comprehensive dialogue between the communities. We would support UNMIC's further reflection on its future role in Kosovo society. Dear colleagues, we have these debates twice a year. Members of the Security Council are presented with two or more Rashomon realities. And even if there is truth in each one of them, the Council is not helping them bring closer as if these debates are not meant to search for solutions and build trust, but rather to expose the differences. What we believe that the Council should do, and what we would like to hear from both parties, is that there is no other way but to accept each other's reality and live with each other and next to each other, that both sides increase efforts to make Kosovo a home for both communities. 
that leaders of both sides put interests, well-being and prosperity of their citizens first, especially for the Serbs in the north. That they increase efforts to implement agreements reached within the EU-facilitated dialogue. That they resist surprises, unilateral actions against, as well as derogatory, derogative rhetorics about the other party. And finally, that there is only win-win solution. Zero-sum game and wins are short-lived. The sooner we all realize it, the better lives will citizens and communities of Kosovo have. Thank you. I thank the representative of Slovenia and I will give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Madam President, we are grateful to the Special Representative of the Secretary General, Karolin Ziad, for the briefing on the situation in the province and for the assessments that she shared with us. We welcome the participation in today's meeting of the President of Serbia, Aleksandr Vucic. We listened to Madam uh, Osmani. Today's incident is something which we'll revert back to. I will merely state that uh, Security Council procedures were established not by Madam Osmani, but rather by the Security Council. Once again, I wish to remind you that Madam Osmani was invited today in her personal capacity. And in this connection, I have a question. Who is seated in the chairs behind Madam Osmani at this moment, and who do they represent? I would like uh, to ask that the Secretary to respond to this question, and for the President also, perhaps uh, after my statement statement they could answer these questions. Madam President, the Security Council today is, uh, care, caring, is conducting a regular meeting on the discussion of the activities of the United Nations mission in Kosovo. This is being carried out against a noteworthy backdrop. Exactly 25 years ago, the NATO aggression against Yugoslavia began, the consequences of which continue to reverberate with a direct impact on the deterioration of the situation in the Balkans. The illegal intervention of NATO in the affairs of a sovereign country transformed into an inhumane bombardment which lasted for 78 days, causing untold suffering for civilians with thousands of casualties and catastrophic devastation and damage. On these days, in 1999, the bombardments were carried out. There were bombings on almost almost every single day. On the 21st of April, an attack hit the refugee camp in Maya. On the 22nd of April, government buildings and civilian infrastructure was destroyed. On the 23rd of April, attacks hit a radio and television building in Serbia. On buildings in Serbia, and on the 27th, there was an egregious, on the 7th of May, there was the egregious incident which occurred, the attack against the uh, People's Republic of China embassy, which is located in Belgrade. We hope that the, that the journalists covering today's meeting will recall those tragic events which could have been avoided had the United States and allies not trampled upon international law. Uh, the NATO aggression against Yugoslavia was an egregious violation of the core principles and purposes of the United Nations Charter, of the Helsinki Final Act of the OSCE, as well as the norms and the principles of international humanitarian law. The authority of the Security Council of the United Nations was undermined, and uh, the Security Council, which had never approved NATO's actions, this aggression became a watershed in international, in global history, and gave rise to the spirit of confrontation in international relations with which had not emerged at that time since the end of the Cold War. And this is specifically what we proposed that the Security Council discuss back in March, discussing not some kind of a historically long forgotten event, contrary to what some said here, but rather to discuss this as a situation, the consequences of which have still not yet been surpassed, the lessons of which have not been duly drawn or learned. However, Western members of the Security Council twice requested a procedural vote to prevent the conduct of that meeting. As it is now clear, this was done not just as a result of their cravenly, cowardly positions, but it is, and not just a desire to 
to sweep the crumbs of those years under the rug, but with the aim of concealing the genuine intent regarding Belgrade and the Serb people. Uh, and this is a situation which logically is a part of the U.S. and E.U. policy of pressure on Serbia. Serbia, which is one of the few European states which is not shying away from conducting an independent policy and upholding its own interests. Nor can we fail to note that in the context of the Security Council meeting, which was not held on the NATO aggression against Yugoslavia, we saw the clear manifest hypocrisy of our French and U.S. colleagues having voted against the discussion of the consequences of the 25th anniversary of the NATO crimes. They insisted to us that the Security Council allegedly uh, should not discuss historic dates. They alleged apparently that the past should not be stirred up, that time should not be spent on this. However, just not even a few weeks passed before the General Assembly, with their direct participation, pushed through a draft resolution on Srebrenica, dedicated to events that are, were even older. It is noteworthy that uh, taking the helm of a new crusade is something which Germany took pains to achieve. Germany, a country which in the 20th century perpetrated the largest genocide in all of human history, in which most Active, most actively participated in the bombing and the destruction of Yugoslavia. It is worth recalling that specifically for the bombardment of Sarajevo, the German Air Force carried out its first combat sorties after 1945. Just think about that. Madam President, the situation in Kosovo and the region on the whole is of great concern to us. The situation continues to deteriorate. The gravity of the situation in the province is attested to by the participation in today's meeting by the President of Serbia. It is becoming increasingly difficult for the collective West to conceal the blatant, systemic, ethnically motivated violence by the provisional bodies of self-governance in Prishna. The so-called Prime Minister, Albin Kurti, effectively is openly seeking to achieve the mass exodus of the non-Albanian population in half a year, only 84 refugees uh, from the 200,000 who left were able to return from the national minorities because it is simply unsafe there for the Serbs, regardless of attempts at obf obfuscation by their Western sponsors. Pristina, time and again, is a thwarting dialogue with Belgrade. It's making it clear that it intends to continue to do so until Serbia recognize Kosovo, recognizes Kosovo's quasi-statehood. This is a guileless a practice which is fully supported by the U.S. and the EU, who are demanding that, Blago, that uh, Belgrade carry out a de facto recognition of Kosovo. They are disregarding the core Brussels Agreement of 2013 to 2015. They are imposing oral agreements from February, March to 2023, which were not signed by anybody, uh, hypocritically calling them legally binding. Just today, during today's uh, meeting, this was mentioned. Instead of good faith mediation, the European Union took the side of Kurti and thereby bearing direct responsibility for the devastating consequences of its policy. Washington and Brussels are supplanting Security Council Resolution 1254 with patently impracticable schemes with a single aim, namely to amputate the southern province from Serbia. And the United Kingdom is playing its, its game here. It has thrust w forward the idea of using the Belfast Agreement dating 1988, 1998 as a model for resolving the Kosovo question. Apparently, Belgrade could assume the role of Dublin vis-a-vis -vis the Northern Irish Catholics. Uh, it is proposed that the Serbs not only resign themselves to the sovereignty of the province, but that they also become guarantors for integrating fellow Kosovo tribesmen in Pristina system of governance. There has been no progress in establishment of the ASMM. Uh, the Western countries, in violation of the Brussels Agreement, have uh, have tailored their draft of the charter for the ASMM to reflect the request of the Kosovars. Competencies have been hollowed out. There have uh, demands have emerged to respect the constitution, laws, and territorial integrity of Kosovo. But this is not enough. Even that is not enough for the Kosovo authorities. In their circle, they have uh, stated that they themselves will write a charter, that they will write, they will draft a charter when they deem it necessary, and when one interprets those words, that means never. 
in the Serb populated northern province, in the Serb populated north of Kosovo, a police, special police force of ethnic Albanians has been deployed to advance its needs. The residents are being stripped of land and other property cover for the rampant lawlessness was provided by the fictional Albanian mayors who usurped power following the pseudo elections in 2023. The, uh, the recall of the so-called city administrators initiated by the citizens was transformed by Mr. Kurti into a farce through crude machinations. It is hardly surprising that uh, the Serbs refused to participate in this farce. The census, which began in April, was also conducted not without fault foul play, where a separate census paper was included to identify damage to citizens during the conflict. Data was recorded only up until June 1999, that is prior to the withdrawal from Kosovo of the Serb army and police. The human and material damage among non-Albanian, for uh, two non-Albanian populations, which took place in the years following the terror unleashed by Pristina is of no interest to the local authorities and is not reflected in the general statistics. These, uh, this is a continuation of the policy discredit Serbs to baselessly pin on them the label of genocidal nature, genocidal, uh, the genocidal nation, which Western countries are striving to achieve, including vis-a-vis -vis the events which took place in Srebrenica. Since June 2023, the import of goods was blocked to the province, and this includes food and medicines from the central part of Serbia. There are systematic liquidations of structures working within the Belgrade system. Since the beginning of the year, the, oper the operations of seven Serb administrations in enclaves to the south of Inbar River have suspended operations. There was an act of dis discrimination on the in the ban of use of the Serb dinar, accompanied by raids by the police, targeting post offices, the closure of banks, the blocking of transport with cash, Albin Kurti and his regime has systematically stripped tens of thousands of people of their livelihoods, waging a veritable campaign of ethnic cleansing. Their ongoing attacks targeting Serb Orthodox church sites, a Serb spiritual heritage is now being Albanized. The unlawful intrusion in November of 2023 into the Archangel Michael Church in Poduyevo by the self-proclaimed priest from Albania who was leading a service in Albanian and announced the establishment of a national Albanian church in the province speaks volumes. Orthodox Orthodox sites are being proclaimed to be Catholic, pious Serbs are being labeled as occupiers, and the history of the province is brazenly, be, brazenly being falsified. In breach of Security Council Resolution 1244, NATO br members are flooding weapons into Kosovo, helping to establish its own army. The Kosovo Albanians themselves are increasingly aggressive. They are announcing large-scale military preparations. They are developing an all-encompassing defense concept. The military budget has continuously and unabatedly risen. In light of all this, we are surprised at the fact that these glaring facts once again are not mentioned at all in the Secretary General's report, nor is there any mention of the humanitarian consequences to the population from the trade blockade of the province and the prohibition on the Serb dinar. In this connection, we demand that the head of the UN Secretariat and its subordinates not conceal inconvenient facts and not provide cover for the Pristina authorities. President, con I I Pristina continues to issue pan-Albanian proclamations in the spirit of accepting Kosovo independence as a temporary project on the path to unification with Albania. Alban Kurti's desire to redraw borders is undermining regional stability and resulting intervention in the domestic affairs of neighboring states. The representatives of his party joined the opposition Albanian coalition for the forthcoming elections in the Parliament of North Macedonia, which President Vucic today mentioned. This is a stark example of how Kosovo authorities are fomenting centrifugal trends in the Balkans. However, instead of warranted condemnation, the Kosovars are receiving concessions from the West through vis-a-vis -vis travel to the Schengen Zone and the advancement of application to membership at the Council of Union. The vote at the, P at the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe on 16 April became yet another heavy blow to international law, contrary to the Charter. 
Uh, the organization is preparing to accept the membership of a non-state. Uh, justified calls from Serbia to await a UN Security Council decision on the status of Kosovo have been disregarded. The list of preliminary demands for Pristina are derisive in nature. The Council of Europe still has a chance to avoid a shameful outcome during the meeting of its committee of accounts of um, ministerial council in May. We call on them to take up take this opportunity. Uh, we worthy of specific mention in the Secretary General's report is the egregious situation with the vandalism of Amic precedents of um, Amic premises in Zvichan and the municipal buildings in Zvichan, Zubin Potok and Leposavich. After the incidents in May 2023, the mission's offices were once again broken into and looted and Kosovo Albanian so-called mayoral staff moved in to one of those. We are talking about a violation by Prishina of the inviolability of UN premises. Alban Kurti has been openly disregarding universally recognized international legal norms, including the 1946 United Nations Convention on Privileges and Immunities, thereby demonstrating his inability to comport himself in a civilized way. And this is not the first time this has been manifest. There has still been no accountability for Kosovo.